So once again, thank you all for being here. I know a lot of you traveled a long way to be here. I hope you'll find this topic really of great interest and enlightenment. My presentation today is entitled Fake Ass Christians. And I think this is a really pertinent topic because I think there's a lot of false religionists who claim morality in today's world and uh, don't really have a lick of it and aren't doing anything to really alleviate the causal factors of human suffering and they're not doing anything to really turn the tide of tyranny that has been going on and increasingly growing worse in our world. I want to expose that here today. As I often say when I begin my presentations, there's nothing new under the sun. You won't really be seeing or hearing any, anything truly, quote, new here today. A lot of people complain about this. They'll hear my presentations and say, oh, he's not saying anything new. This is a spiritual information that's been out there for millennia. Yeah, exactly. The, the problem is getting it integrated into the human mind and behavior. As the old saying goes, there's nothing new under the sun. This old adage means that the truth is objective and eternal. It's always been here. It's always going to be here. Our job is to see it. And all I can do is present it with my personalized aesthetic applied and in my own presentation style. My catchphrase for my entire speaking career has been and continues to be, get as offended as you like. Just by a show of hands, how many people have never heard me really deliver a full presentation or heard me speak? Anybody totally new to my information? Okay, about three or four people, that's not, not too bad. So um, my presentation style, uh, in case you haven't noticed from the little preamble that we did this morning, uh, can be kind of caustic. I'm not here to be liked or be friends with people. I'm here to tell people harsh truths and harsh realities that we're undergoing in the world. So my style has been described as intense and even combative. And that's fine. I have no problem with that. Some people may become offended or upset by things that they'll hear me say during this lecture or seminar. And that's fine. I tell people, get as offended as you like because the truth isn't going away. It's what it is, regardless of how you feel about it. And truth is by its nature belligerent, especially to those who are under an illusion. Truth wages war with mind control and illusion. So for people to hear something that they're uncomfortable with, that means it's going to work, it's planting a seed, it's getting into the subconscious mind. You can't unhear something. I certainly don't pr present this information to be liked. As I said this morning, if I wanted to do that, I would tell people what they want to hear, and most people don't want to hear what I have to say. I don't present this to be popular. You're not going to make a lot of friends telling people what they don't want to hear. And I certainly don't make it do it to make money. I appreciate the donations that come in to help my efforts, but by no means will uh, the meager amounts of money that do come in uh, would allow any sort of an extravagant lifestyle. As I told people this morning, I live in a one-bedroom apartment with another person. Um, I do this because I recognize the moral imperative to do it. Because if this isn't done, then the world's going to degrade and decay into chaos and tyranny even faster than it already is. And that's why I encourage more people to take up the banner and actually put the truth out there in their own way by becoming a teacher of spiritual information once they have all their grammar in line. So I do this because in a world of deceit and deception that we're living in, it's a moral obligation to communicate this information with other people so you could help them to understand it and maybe you could help them to stop inflicting self-inflicted suffering. Every person who wants to take away real value from this seminar should make a deliberate and conscious effort to do two things. The first is to set aside your perceptions of me 
as the presenter. I'm not the one who is important here. The information is what is important. Okay, so don't focus on my voice, the sound of my voice. If you think I have a Philadelphia or a South Philadelphia accent, okay, how I dress. I just got an email from somebody, okay, just as a quick side note. It says, says I think your style of dress is horrible. You, know, you don't have any fashion sense. Like, yeah, that's where I'm going for it. So, and they don't want to listen to my information because I don't appeal to them fashion-wise. Yeah. Right. The information is what is important, folks, not me. I'm just the messenger. I'm just the carrier for the information. I am not the important one. The information is what is of critical importance. Be consciously aware of any impulses you may have to reject the information I present here today based on your initial emotional response to it. This is thinking with your emotions, and that's a logical fallacy. Thinking can't be done with the emotions. The emotions are there to help us feel the repercussions of our actions toward ourselves and others, not to come to the veracity of any given subject. You can't determine truthfulness based on how something makes you feel when you hear it. So do not fall victim to what I call emotional mind control by rejecting something and saying, that isn't true, just because you currently don't happen to like to hear it. So let me tell people a little bit about what this presentation is not going to be. Definitely not. This will not be a religious presentation that is a, an attempt to convert anyone to any particular kind of religious faith or belief. So if all the Christians out there think that, you know, oh, the big you know, swerve is going to come at the end where he says that he's a devout religionist and accepts Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. You're going to be sorely disappointed in this presentation. Okay? I'm not here to convert anybody or espouse my religious beliefs because I don't have any religious beliefs. I have spiritual understanding, which is entirely different from religious belief. This is not an attempt to demonize one modern Christian sect or denomination in favor of another. I'm not playing sides, taking sides. You know, some re researcher recently said uh, he's a, a Presbyterian. You know, like where in the hell did anyone get the idea that I favor some denomination of Christianity? You know, when I'm, I've been telling people since day one, religion's the whole problem with the entire world. As what I'm going to explain to you here today is Christianity was originally an esoteric philosophy that predates even the uh, supposed historical uh, uh, time that Christ lived in. So this is not me getting up here and saying, oh, let me attack Catholicism in, in favor of Protestantism. You know, that's not what this is. So if you're expecting that, you'll be disappointed as well. And thirdly, this is not a presentation of atheism that is attempting to dismiss any higher power than humankind. I think that's a dangerous ideology in and of itself, and I'll be discussing atheism as well. But I am not going to be doing any Bible thumping or cross-waving in this presentation. So fear not, that is not what this presentation is about. More on what this is not. People will often react to new information with prejudice based on a pre-existing belief system or a religion. And they will filter out what they don't want to hear. So I'm asking everyone, listen very carefully to what I say. Don't put words in my mouth. Don't get things twisted. Okay? Attempt to truly comprehend my words throughout the day. Genuine Christians should find no offense in anything that I say in this presentation. Because this presentation is not an attack against genuine Christian behavior. I'll tell you what, folks. I got more drop-offs from my mailing list than ever before pr just promoting this presentation. More people said, I'm done with you and I don't even want your information via email on the mailing list that they signed up for because of the, the name and poster without even hearing the information. That's how prejudiced people are. 
They don't even want to hear the information first before they make a judgment about it. That's religion. That's what religion does. Okay? So, I'm not going to be attacking genuine Christians. I'm not claiming in this presentation that all forms of Christianity are fake. A lot of people said to me, why bother covering this topic? All Christianity is fake because there's no such thing as Jesus. Okay? I'm not attempting to tell people that all of it is fake because the original esoteric form of this philosophy, which embodies the ideals of what many have referred to as Christ consciousness, has existed for thousands of years before the time when Jesus Christ was said to have lived. And this esoteric philosophy holds genuine transformative power in the world. That being said, if you attempt to bring your existing set of false religious beliefs into a genuine search for truth, you're going to get nothing but suffering and disappointment every time. Don't be the child trying to cling on to their possession and feeling all insulted because, you know, uh, you're attacking my personal way of viewing the world. All right? You're not going to pick up anything valuable from this presentation. It has to be listened to in its entirety with an open mind. And that goes for the people. I know that doesn't go for the people in this room. I know you guys already have an open mind. I, I know that this goes for largely the people who will be listening to this on the internet, on YouTube, or on my website, and don't really know my work, and already come in with a preconceived religious ideology. What this presentation is, it is an expose on people who behave in a decidedly unchristian manner while calling themselves Christian. This presentation is an attack on fake Christians, as the name implies, and will expose the hallmark behaviors of those who are decidedly not in alignment with true Christian ideals. These are people who are posing as Christians. They are imposters who believe that they are authentic in their own mind. They're authentic Christians. Yet they live by the dogma of a co-opted false version of Christianity, which is actually completely contrary to the philosophy and ideals of true esoteric Christianity. It is important to note and understand that these fake so-called Christians are found equally in all denominations of modern so-called Christianity. So it doesn't matter what denomination you go to, you're going to find imposters and phonies. These fake Christians will be the ones who will take offense to what is said in this presentation. And these are the people that should be taking offense to it because that's who I'm directing this presentation toward and against. I am exposing their hypocrisy. If you're not a true Christian in thought, emotion, and action, then yes, most likely you will be very offended by what I have to say here today. If you are a so-called Christian who is offended by what is revealed in this presentation, then by the time you finish hearing this information, my hope is that you'll receive and understand the knowledge that is necessary to align yourself with true and authentic ideals and behaviors of a being that embodies genuine Christ consciousness. Hopefully, I can get some of the fake Christians out there to understand what a real Christian is and start to turn their value system around. Maybe. We'll see. I am today going to expose what people seem to be on the surface, but then you dig a little bit deeper, and there's something entirely different altogether. They are posing as that thing in name only. And this could go for anything. This could go for any belief system. This can go for uh, any type of an individual that is claiming to be one thing, but really they're a snake in the grass. Really they wear a mask and they are someone entirely different than who they claim to be. This goes really hand in hand with the fundamental foundation of all of my work as a presenter and a spiritual teacher because I consider one of the main philosophical um, groundwork upon which I base all of my teaching is the distinction between the genuine world or the natural world 
and the artificial world, the world of simply constructural ideas that aren't genuine in nature and aren't inherent to nature. And this is part of the problem, is people believe in illusion. They believe in things that aren't true. They believe in fantasy. My work delineates reality and illusion. That's what I think is the mo one of the most important things to helping people to break the spells that they are under, the mind control that they are under. The mind control is falseness. It's illusion. It doesn't hold any real weight, bearing, or morality in the real world. And that's why the world's going into total abject enslavement if we don't turn it around and recognize reality from fantasy, if we don't recognize truth from falsehood. Fundamental fabric of my work from day one. And this presentation will be a continuance of that theme. So a lot of people fall into the dialectic of religion versus atheism. This is a mind control dialectic and it's a divide and conquer strategy dialectic. In two false extremes, you'll always be wrong. See, there is no truth in the two false extremes. I'm neither a religionist nor an atheist. And then when you say that to people, they melt down on you. They have no idea what to do with you at that point. Well, I can't put you in a box. I can't put a label on you. I subscribe to no world, worldly religion, and yet I am not an atheist. I believe that there is a higher power in the universe that governs the universe and governs behavior according to law. And that law is knowable. And the way that we can know that is a science, not a belief system. I've never been teaching or telling anybody a belief system. I don't want anybody to believe anything. I think belief is the death of freedom. I think everybody should know, not believe anything. Knowledge comes through science, through true science. Now, I'm not a scientism guy either who props, you know, state-funded science up as my religion. There's another thing. So, so now people really don't know what to do with you. You know, because you're telling them, well, I'm not an atheist. I don't believe in, uh, I don't think that science as we see science today in the modern world is the only mechanism that leads to truth. And I'm not, a, I don't subscribe to any religion on the face of the earth. Well, now you really can't be put in a box. And that's ultimately what all these systems and dialectics are for. They're designed to put consciousness in a box. To say, you may consider anything in this box, but anything outside of this box is off limits for your consumption or consideration. And what that is, is a system of control. So I don't subscribe to the religious idea that spirit is prime and the physical world is evil or should be rejected or abstained from. Nor do I believe the atheistic perspective that matter is prime. And we're just going to get to that God particle and understand everything there is to know about creation. You know, both of these are false paradigms and nonsensical paradigms as far as I'm concerned. So I'm neither one of these guys. You will be hit with neither one of this kind of in insanity today. Okay? I'm not the religionist who's the Bible thumper and going to say Jesus is the only answer and, and be a Jesus freak up here. Okay? By any stretch of the imagination. Nor am I going to come up here and stick, bear, stick my chest out and say, I'm an atheist, come and debate me. And science has every answer that we could act, a, ever possibly have a question for. So that's not this presentation either. However, the biblical figure of Jesus will be talked about fairly extensively in this presentation today. And that's unavoidable, unavoidable because he is the allegorical figure of the esoteric philosophy in the modern world that I'll be discussing. My point here is regardless of whether you think Jesus was a physical man, teacher in Judea at the turn of the first century, okay, or you think he's just an allegorical myth, does not matter in the slightest bit to me. I could not care less 
whether or not you believe in the historicity of this figure. Honestly, to me, it's meaningless. The philosophy and the behavior is what is important, not whether you accept him as a physical presence in the world or not. The teachings found in the words of Jesus regarding how to behave toward others are what is truly important, not his historical authenticity. People get too tied up in this, you know? And then it causes just infighting and nobody's actually talking about the philosophy, which is what's important. They get hung up on the little details. And I consider this a little detail because ultimately it's the ideas that are transformative, not the man. Again, that's why I tell you, it doesn't matter whether you like me, care about me, want, want to know anything there is to know about me. I'm, I'm completely unconcerned whether you even know the name Mark Passano. All I want you to know is the information that I happen to understand because I believe that it can, I don't believe, I know that it is capable of transforming the world for the better if everybody takes it into themselves and then acts upon it. And I think that's the same for this individual or even if it's an allegorical figure. The, teaching are, are, the teachings are what is important. That's what holds the transformative power. To understand the esoteric teachings is what we have to get out of studying this information. Not getting hung up on, you know, well, what year was he born? What was his birthday? You know, what color robes did he wear? Where, where did he, what city did he actually teach in? None of these are the important things. The, the, the concepts about behavior and how we should align our behavior to true morality is what, have, is what is of utmost critical importance, especially in the times we live in. <clears throat> the core essence of true Christianity is in living like Christ in the biblical New Testament stories. Living according to a true morality. It's not about following the dictates and the laws of the church. It's not about whether you eat meat on Fridays of Lent. Okay, It's not about whether you go to church every Sunday faithfully. It's about how you treat others. And Christians have often lost sight of this. Fake Christians have lost sight of this concept. I'd say a good chunk of them have lost sight of that. And they get all hung up in the dogma. They get hung up in the dogma and they get hung up, as I'll talk about later, in the false morality, in the arbitrary and uh, personal likes and dislikes that they will then call morality instead of what real morality is. So it's all about the behavior, folks. It's not about intent. It's not about dogma. Okay? It's about what kind of behaviors can actually lead to a better world based in freedom. But religion exists. And the people who co-opted this in its early goings said, well, instead of living like Christ, you know, what's that really going to do for us in the in the as far as the worldly matters of the world go, because these people are often psychopathic and want power and wealth. So they said, instead of really teaching people to live like Christ, let's start a religion. What better way to control people? What better way to gather the wealth of the world to our hands? Again, with how gullible most people are and how non-logically their mind works. People, friends of mine joke around with me all the time. They're like, Mark, you could start a new religion. I'm like, I'd rather destroy it all. I'm not interested in starting a religion. I want to wipe it all out. You know? They're like, you could, you could start a cult and be a cult member and get followers and have, you know, make millions of dollars and have people practically worshiping you. I'm like, yeah, that, that would accomplish a whole lot. Especially for you know my actual like eternal soul too. That would be great karma, you know. Uh, not interested in any of those things. Don't, as I said earlier today, I don't. I, I don't even want like psychophantic followers. It makes me creeps me out badly. 
I want equals. I want to be around equals, not people looking up to me and thinking I'm some great thing. Okay? The information is what is great. That's the great work, and that's what we need to communicate. I'm not the important one. So, you know, this is what people who recognize the gullibility of man and who recognized how easy it would be to manipulate them decided, let's start a religion. Then we really have something going. Then we really have people uh, living and breathing and dying at our command. And that was the co-opting of true Christianity and turning it into a religion. And who did this were dark occultists. People who you should consider ancient psychologists with high level knowledge of how the human mind works. That's why they knew people are always trying to externalize power and seek power outside of themselves to save them from their own wrongdoings, from their own misdeeds. And so no better thing to do than invent a new savior myth, a new savior religion. You have to believe in this. You have to worship this. You have to externalize your power to this. It's your savior. You're not going to be your savior through your behavior and teaching other people to change their behavior. That won't save the world. No, you just have to accept our belief and dogma and then some, somehow magically the world will be changed for the better. No, what will happen is you'll have more mindless followers who can become easily misled and persuaded into doing all kinds of evil as we will see. And these dark occultists concealed the genuine teachings from the people. That is why the true form of Christianity that I'm going to explain here today is occultism. It is hidden knowledge. That the dark occult controllers took away from the people, concealed it, twisted it and co-opted it as something it was never intended to be and hid the genuine philosophical teachings from people so that they could never actually integrate that knowledge into themselves, transform their behavior with it, and ultimately transform the world with it. They recognized the true genuine power of the original esoteric school of thought that I'm referring to in this presentation as Christianity, which we will talk about. People have been sold a fake bill of goods. And because they don't have the discernment capabilities to distinguish between the fake and the genuine, they are the blind being led by the blind. And where will that take you? That's going to take you into chaos, suffering, and ultimately oblivion. That's where it will take you. That's where it is taking us. I ask people, what has organized religion really done to help the world? Is the world in some kind of a great place for all the thousands of years it has existed? You know, we're descending into tyranny radically. More and more people are under mind control. More and more people are completely ignorant. What's religion done in all of its history to alleviate that ignorance and suffering? Squat is what it has amounted to. Nothing. All it's doing is giving people false hope and a false version of reality to believe in, in their ignorance. And all that's going to do is create more illusion that leads to more suffering. Well, what we need to be doing is discerning reality for ourselves and understanding the causal factors of what got us into this condition in the first place. Only by making that diagnosis of causal factors are we ever going to change the current human condition. Why did true Christianity have to be co-opted? Had to be co-opted. They could not allow this. The controllers of the world and the ruling class of the world could not allow this esoteric philosophy to breed. They had to rein it in. Authentic Christian teachings were subverted as they were handed down through the centuries. This presentation will examine the many ways modern Christians have strayed dramatically from the original esoteric Christian knowledge and practices. It's imperative that this topic be brought into the light 
for open discussion if humankind is to direct itself back upon a moral path. The mind controllers and social engineers of the world needed to co-opt these teachings and pervert them because those who knew this information would not ever be easily controlled or brought to the, be to the bidding of the ruling class. If you understand the esoteric variant of Christianity, you are not going to be controlled externally by a manipulator or a manipulator class of people. You are going to understand your individual sovereignty under the creator, and that is going to lead to a being that is non-manipulatable and uncontrollable. The rulers of the world can't have that, folks. They want us fighting with each other eternally. That divide and conquer method weakens us and strengthens them. The main purpose of all false religion is to control people by distracting them from an accurate understanding of natural law. Natural law is what I refer to as the most deeply occulted information on the face of the earth because it's the understanding of what real morality is. And the control class does not want you to understand real morality because they know immorality is what keeps them in control of the masses of people. That lack of understanding creates infighting among the slave class and makes them far easier for their masters and the ruling class to control. This is simple dialectics and divide and conquer strategy. One only needs to look at the history of war, division, and distrust that religion has fomented in, human, in, in humanity, and the endless suffering created by people who have claimed to be acting, quote-unquote, in God's name. Some of the worst deeds in human history have done by those claiming that they had God on their side and were acting in his name. Religion is the one and only problem in the world, folks. It's the one and only problem. People, they'll do these little Facebook memes, you know, where, where they'll say, if you could alleviate one thing in the world, what would it be? And my answer is always the same, religion. Because if you understand what religion really means, you understand it is not doing anything good for anyone. It is what is holding us back. The word religion itself comes from the Latin verb religare. The verb religare means to bind, to hold back by tying, or to thwart from forward progress. So if in ancient Latin you describe tying a horse to a post so it couldn't move, you would use the term religare, to tie it up, to thwart it from moving away, to keep it where it is. That's what religion does. Now, there's an alternate definition of religion, which means to tie back to or to reunite with something. And I would suggest that's what true religion is, meaning there's only really one thing that is true religion, and that's truth. We need to reunite with truth. We need to reunite with true morality. You know, that's how I would use the term in the positive sense. But in general, religion is the hidden hand behind all world domination and control. Not money and not even government is ultimately at the top of the food chain and what is really directing the dark occult agenda. People will often think, oh, it's people in the government, it's the, the shadow government, you know, it's the, the deep state, and then other people go, no, it's the bankers, it's the international bankers, the World Bank, etc. No, folks, it's religion. Religion is at the high, highest end, the highest, at the peak of the pyramid of control. Because what ultimately controls the world is a priest class, a sick, de demonic, sorcerer class. And believe me, they have a religion. And they're giving it indirectly to people. Make no mistake about it, religion is the force that runs this world. It's the entire problem with this world, specifically the false religions of authority, government, and money. Not just the cultural religions, 
do we define as religion? Do I define as religion? You ask people, what's government? And 99% of people or more will not tell you government is a religion. But it in fact is a religion because it's something that thwarts our forward progress and consciousness. Money is a religion because it also holds back our progress in spiritual understanding and consciousness. Truth is the one and only true religion. Meaning that knowing the truth about who we are and how the laws of reality really work is the only thing that can reunite humanity's collective behavior into accordance with natural law. Again, another meaning of the word religion is to reunite. To seek and understand the truth about what's happening within and around us is essential and is an essential and fundamental aspect of true Christianity. True Christians understand human consciousness. They don't shy away from the word consciousness. Fake Christians do that. A lot of fake Christians hear the term Christ consciousness and they're, oh, it's New Age stuff. Trust me, I'm as far away from New Age religion as you can possibly get. I, I've done whole seminars called New Age Bullshit. So I'm not up here trying to propose the New Age religion to people. I'm trying to talk about what real spirituality and consciousness is all about. The true science of natural law lies at the heart of true Christianity. I mean, that is the essence of this presentation. The allegorical figure or historical man of Jesus Christ was trying to teach people natural law. So what he was doing, whether you consider it in the physical world, in the area called Judea, or whether you consider it just a biblical allegory in the New Testament, that is what the figure of Jesus was doing. Natural law is the, tr the true nature and teaching of esoteric Christianity, as it is the true nature and teaching of all religions, world religions, cultural religions. The deep core essence of the genuine article was always about natural law. And then it got distorted and twisted because the controllers know. If the people know natural law, game over for us. You know, they, they know this definitively. They know they have to try to dissuade us from looking into this. Natural law is a set of universal, inherent, objective, non-man-made, eternal and immutable conditions which govern the consequences of behaviors of beings with the capacity for understanding the difference between harmful and non-harmful behavior. Now that's a mouthful. I'll say it one more time. Natural law is a set of universal. Everywhere in the universe, you cannot go anywhere in the universe to escape natural law. No matter where you go, it exists. Inherent, meaning it's built in. Built into creation. You cannot separate it from creation itself. Objective. That's mean it has nothing to do with your subjective opinion. Doesn't matter whether you like it, dislike it, understand it, don't understand it, doesn't matter. It's like any other physical law. It exists objectively. It's non-man-made. Human beings did not put this law into effect. A higher power in creation did. It's eternal. Doesn't matter what time period you're living in. It, it has always been, it is now, and it will always be. And it's immutable. And this means it's completely unchangeable. Nothing that you do can ever change it. It will exist regardless of what you do. Regardless of whether you try to break it. Regardless of whether you just flaunt your behavior in the face of it. Regardless of whether you refuse to accept or understand it. It will exist and continue to exist. And you cannot change it. You cannot do anything to break this law ultimately. It governs the consequences of behavior. This is what this law does. It isn't the behavior itself. It brings us the consequences of the behaviors that we choose. And it applies to beings who have the capacity to understand the difference between right behavior and wrong behavior. Natural law is not a law. The moral laws of creation apply to higher level intelligence in creation. It doesn't apply to amoebas or shellfish or 
you know, even beasts of the field like lions and gazelles, etc. There, that, that's, you know, what people will call, you know, the natural world. They are natural creatures in the world, but that is not natural law. We're not talking about Darwinism. We're not talking about just the physical beings in the, in the world. We're talking about moral law. Moral law is what natural law is. And moral law does not apply to beings that don't have the developmental capacity in consciousness, brain chemistry, you know, their, their entire uh, neurological network makeup does not get, grant them the capacity like our brain systems do to comprehend the, what morality is and what the difference between right and wrong are. That's why natural law applies to us and not animals. Because we are not just animals. We are human animals. We are human beings. And we have animal component to us, a mammalian component. However, we are much more than the animal side because of the complexity of the human brain and thought processes and the level of free will and spirit that the human being is gifted with. So we have the ability to discern, whereas a dog does not. That's why we are gifted with a higher level of free will than the animal kingdom. So natural law applies to us. It does not apply to the, the general animal kingdom that is non-human. This philosophy predates Christianity by thousands of years and can be traced back to ancient sol solar hero myths, which represented alignment with natural law. Knowledge, the sun. We'll get to that symbolism later. The Christ figure of the New Testament scripture is an extension and or representation of this sun hero tradition who embodies the fullness of natural law itself. That's what this allegorical figure is ultimately all about. He is emb the embodiment of living a life in accordance with natural law. That's a good role model to have. Natural law, just to be very clear about this, I, I want to actually just show it on a slide for people who may be new to it or watching on YouTube. So there's no misconstruing it. Natural law is also known as moral law, cosmic law, universal law, consequentialism or consequential law meaning it gives us the consequences of our behavior. Karmic law, or just karma, plain and simple. Or God's law. And I know a lot of people have a problem with the word God. Couldn't give a shit. <laughs> Couldn't care less whether you have a problem with the word God. Get over yourself. Okay? That's all I have to say about that. So for the, the atheist slash statheists out there, uh, I'm not interested in whether you have a problem with my usage of the word God. I see God as the universal underlying creative intelligence and creative force in the universe that put all the laws in, into the universe in effect, both physical and spiritual. And I'm going to use that term because that's what, to me, God is. So this is God's law that we're talking about, not man's law. Natural law is... And let me just really emphasize this with the power of my voice. Natural law is definitely not and has nothing to do with Darwinism. Okay, please understand this. I am not up here preaching Darwin's ridiculous theories of one species becoming another. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about morality and moral law. Okay, Darwin's theories regarding the supposed, quote, natural order. This is why people, the, the word natural is so bastardized in the modern world. You say the word natural and people, oh, boom, immediately have to equate it to Darwinism. As if he has, what, a monopoly on the word natural. The natural order, because that's what they think I'm saying. I think they think the natural law means the natural order of Darwin, and it does not. First of all, there's nothing natural in that, and there's nothing orderly in it. It's actually artificially imposed chaos. Because what it's all, all really ultimately about is racism, 
and it's about becoming psychopathic enough to just be the most vicious of creatures to rule others. That's what real Darwinism is really telling people to live by and, and be about. Okay? It's t telling people they're no different than the animals of the field. It's certainly, natural law is certainly not the survival of the fittest. Okay? We're not talking about the survival of the fittest, the most ruthless. Natural law is about doing the right thing and receiving orderly consequences and freedom as a result versus doing the wrong thing and receiving chaotic consequences and slavery as the result. That's what natural law is. So for first-timers and people listening on the internet, understand this. This is the title card of the nine-hour long seminar I gave on natural law several years back. It is the most critical work that I have ever put out. People cannot understand what I am ultimately talking about without watching this presentation in its entirety. Most so-called Christians desperately need to watch this presentation in its entirety. Maybe you'll go from being a fake-ass Christian to a genuine Christian when you're done watching it. One of the underlying things to understand about genuine Christianity is what the figure of Jesus really represents. What you're reading about in the Bible is a being who is teaching people how to live an anarchist lifestyle. How to live with only natural law as a guide and a role model. Jesus was an anarchist. Absolutely was an anarchist. A genuine anarchist. Again, not one of these absolute fake-ass anarchists. Well, I need to do a whole presentation called Fake-Ass Anarchists, and I'm going to. Okay? Because let me tell you something, there are so many groups of fake anarchists out there. We have a whole crap load of them right here in the city of Philadelphia. Okay? who are communists in disguise, posing as anarchists, preaching Marxism and saying that's anarchy. No, that's called slavery. They haven't figured that out yet. Because they have no long view of history at all. They run screaming if you hold up a history book and say you might want to check this out. Here's what happened. Jesus was an anarchist who was in open rebellion against all false authority and false doctrine. He taught the spiritual principles encompassed by natural law. The non-aggression principle and the principle of self-defense against the violation of rights. So, he was teaching people the two pillars of enlightenment. He was teaching, don't aggress against others or their rights. But if others do aggress against you or your rights, you have a right to use self-defense of force against that incursion of your rights, against the violation against your rights. In other words, don't be ruled by anyone and do no harm, but take no shit. That is essentially what Jesus was teaching in the New Testament teachings. And no Christian will tell you that. No so-called Christian will tell you that. Oh, one is telling you that right now. So I do consider myself an esoteric Christian. However, people who say, oh, I'm Christian. I follow the teachings of the church and I follow the teachings of the Bible. They won't tell you this. They can't even cognize it. They can't even conceive of it. They can't even grasp the fact that Jesus is an anarchist trying to teach people how to live an anarchistic lifestyle and do away with worldly authority and false teaching, false spirituality. They don't even grasp the concept of who the institution Jesus was at war against, at spiritual combat against. Christians don't even know this, even though it's written right there in their own scripture for them to see. Jesus taught that every human being is born a sovereign being with self-ownership, freedom, and free will. 
And these virtues are not bestowed upon them by man, but instead are their birthright given by the God of creation. And they're not negotiable. Our rights are birthright. Our rights are freedom and our sovereignty are not negotiable because they are the birthright of the creator of the universe that the creator of the universe endowed to us as a result of us simply being existing in the universe. They are our birthrights. To be like Christ begins with the possession and exercise of conscience, of true conscience. What this means is possessing the objective knowledge of which behaviors are rights because they don't cause harm to others. Which behaviors are wrongs because they do cause harm to others. And then after such knowledge has been integrated into one's being, willfully and in every moment of one's life, making the free will decisions to choose right action over wrong action using that knowledge, conscience, as a guide. This is the basic moral teachings of Jesus as outlined in the New Testament. And Christians can't even really express that in words. So-called Christians. This basic Christ-like behavior in the world requires and involves zero belief. No belief is required, folks. The real aspect of esoteric Christianity is not a religion. It is a way of being and acting in the world that anyone can align their behavior to, which has absolutely nothing to do with believing things that aren't true, accepting religious dogma, accepting any worldly authority like a church or a state. No belief systems or illusions are required. It's an understanding of law that is in place in the universe and how to align our behavior to that law so that you don't cause harm to yourself and others. That's all it is. See, it's like understanding that the force that we refer to as gravity is in effect. Right? This is why you wouldn't go up to, on top of a tall building and walk over the edge unless you're a stupid idiot who wants to die. And that's what people who don't want to understand natural law are. They're stupid idiots who want to die and be enslaved before they die. That's really what they are. Okay? They refuse to accept something as simple and fundamental as a force that if they flagrantly attempt to violate it, is going to kill them. And natural law is not going to kill them. The consequences that they receive as a result of trying to break natural law is ultimately going to get them. They don't understand the causal factors that create order or chaos. Because that is what natural law is. And I'm telling you, I have this discussion with people in the so-called truth movement. I go to meetups, I try to talk to them about it, and they're abs a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot, are ab they don't want to hear about it. They, don't, they think this is religion. They actually believe what I'm talking about is religion. When I'm outrightly telling them I'm trying to destroy all religion on the face of the earth. Because all it does is hold back consciousness. And they will say, oh, that's a belief system. Oh, that comes out of religion. You know, they'll be like, no, there's no such thing. I believe in the physical laws and that's all there is. Because they're atheists who believe in the primacy of matter. And I'm going to get to a whole section on atheism in this presentation. Why it's so dangerous, the kind of beliefs it will lead to. And why atheists were shunned from... Uh, were, were turned out from being taught this information in the ancient world. Mystery schools wouldn't even teach them. So I'll, I'm willing to at least put them on the same playing field and give them the information. You know, because they have the intellectual capacity to understand it. The problem is they don't have genuine holistic intelligence. They don't have the heart-based and the spiritual-based mind to comprehend true knowledge. They can crunch numbers all day long. Well, common sense, that's a little bit different of a story for them. Humanity's one true divide 
The only thing that really, really defines a true difference between human beings, there's only two kinds of human beings in the world, folks. There are anarchists and statists. There are people who know what true freedom is, and there are people who believe that slavery must continue. I put this slide in my original New Age bullshit presentation, and I think people got a pretty good kick out of it, how I compared Jesus to the anarchist, you know, represented him as the anarchist, who's, you know, saying most of his followers are statists. They're the exact polar opposite of what he's teaching. Now, they're, they're, you couldn't have any deeper irony. Jesus is the anarchist trying to teach people natural law, and the people who are calling him, themselves his followers are the polar opposite philosophy, ideology of him, and their status to believe that slavery has to continue in the world through government. Statism, the brilliant idea that we give a small group of people the right to kidnap, steal from, and kill us so that we can protect it from people who will kidnap, steal from, and kill us. Yeah, that makes perfect damn sense, doesn't it? The logic is just that it's flawless, you know. Lovers of truth and freedom are the true followers of Christ and his message. See, no, you'll never hear a Christian tell you that. You'll never hear a Christian religionist tell you that. No Christian has ever said to me, ultimately what Christianity is about is freedom. It's about knowing the truth so we can be free. No. They'll tell you it's about believing in Jesus as your personal Savior, and if you don't, you're going to go to hell. Freedom isn't even a word in their lexicon. You know? You'll very rarely even hearing freedom versus tyranny discussed in any religious institution or organization. They just stay completely away from the damn word itself. They won't even use the word freedom. Certainly won't tell you what's really involved to acquire it, because half of them are too ignorant to know that. They don't even know that themselves. The people who are destroying Christ consciousness, destroying Christ and his message are statists. Because they're putting Satan's kingdom into effect. They're putting the kingdom of the adversary into effect. The dark new world order. They're putting a system of violence, coercion, and slavery into effect in the world. And people like that would dare to call themselves after the name of Christ. Even the conceptual name, I don't care, like I said, I could care less whether you think it's a genuine figure. Even to call yourself after the concept of Christ is practically a, a, a sacrilege because of what the concept represents. And then people will say, yeah, I'm a follower of that. And then in the next breath tell you government must exist. Or they'll even tell you it's ordained by God. Oh, we're going to get to that, don't worry. Imposter Christians, intention is meaningless, behavior is everything. You forget what people tell you, oh, I, I intended that. This is what I really want, this is what I really mean. And then they go and do something entirely different. Their behaviors betray them. Imposter Christians believe that their behavior embodies the teachings of Jesus as put forward in the New Testament. Key word there, believe. Yet they don't understand or live by the non-aggression principle, nor do they practice the golden rule. Fake Christians support all of the institutions that Jesus was rebelling against and that Jesus was teaching about as a form of spiritual enslavement, including religion, money, and government, what I refer to as the unholy trinity. These are the very institutions Jesus was at war with during his life, and that he spiritually taught against and was trying to explain to people these are these three things comprise a spiritual enslavement system. And once again, you'll never hear that from a so-called religionist Christian because they're imposters. Understand this biblical adage, you shall know them by their fruits. 
You will know them by their deeds. You will know them by their actions. Not their words. Not what they say they intend. All of that is meaningless. You have to look at what someone's behavior is. What are they really building in the world? What are they manifesting in the world through their behavior? And if you look at the true answer, and if you're honest with yourself, what they are manifesting in the world is slavery, not freedom. Not what God wants, which is freedom for everyone. They're manifesting slavery, which God wants for no one. Authentic Christian knowledge and behavior. This meme says, if you're really a Christian, it will show itself in the way you live. Could, I couldn't agree more. We will know them by their fruits, by their deeds. An authentic Christian exercises conscience and lives by the non-aggression principle and the self-defense principle and does not condone or support any institutions which perpetuate any form of Slavery. True Christians reject all forms of human and worldly, quote, authority because they know definitively that no worldly powers can ever be higher than the God of creation. There is no higher power than the creator of the universe and the laws of the universe. And man is not it. Man is not that power, ladies and gentlemen. Anybody who claims man is up on that level of power is worse than delusional. They have had a complete psychotic break with reality. True Christians seek knowledge of true spiritual awakening. And we'll talk about what that means. Even if such knowledge has been occulted from them. So they're going to go into the nooks and crannies into the hidden areas, into the locked doors, the locked and sealed passageways. They're going to go wherever they have to go to get the knowledge that is required to truly awaken. They don't shun or fear the occult. They practice the golden rule and they place ethics above their own personal gain. And that's more than I can say for most modern Christians because they are largely completely focused on their own gain most of them just only care that they're saved, quote unquote. Most of them care about money. It's, money is more their God than, than Jesus or, or the God of creation is their God. You know, and the, their, their personal gain is paramount. And that's not Christianity, folks. That's called Satanism. I know. I was a priest in that religion and I know what its tenets are. And that putting that level of personal gain above people is called Satanism, not Christianity. I already came out with a primer for true Christianity and nobody really knew. I snuck that in. It was called Streetwise Spirituality. And what I really did in that presentation is give all the hallmarks of true esoteric Christian knowledge. Spiritual knowledge. What does it mean to truly be awake? What does being awake really mean spiritually? And I, in, this, in this presentation, I outlined 20 factors. I gave this back in 2014, and I outlined 20 factors of true spiritual awakening. And th these are actually worth reiterating briefly. because I, I consider this, this presentation is an addendum or an adjunct to my natural law seminar. And I think it goes hand in hand with it. It's very critical to understand because a lot of people throw this word awake or conscious out and they have the slightest idea what it really means. And they're, they're peddling fake spirituality and telling people, oh, if you're like this, you're awake. These factors are genuine spiritual awakening. One, my first and foremost factor for awakening. Now just think about this for a minute. Hey, out of all the things I could possibly tell people, this is what it means to be awake. This is what I consider number one and most important. Knowledge of the occult. And understanding that there are both light aspects to occultism and dark aspects to occultism. That it is a dual-edged sword 
and the knowledge is just a tool. It can be used to uplift consciousness or it could be used to control and enslave. And you know, like the gentleman who asked the question earlier in the early, earlier session today, okay, these people are ancient psychologists. Well, what do we need to do to, to break through and understand the psychology they're using against us? We have to become psychologists. The same thing applies. If we are dealing with dark occultists who are using knowledge of the human psyche to control and enslave, we have to become occultists and use it for the light slash right reasons, which is to uplift consciousness, help people to understand how they're being played and manipulated. That's all the knowledge of the occult. And then primary knowledge in the occult, in the world of occultism, is the knowledge of natural law. If you don't, if you don't know occultism, you can't know natural law. Because natural law is, a, is a, a body of information that is encompassed by occultism. You have to delve into the world of the occult to understand natural law. If you do understand natural law, you have already penetrated the world of the occult. People don't understand this. And they still think the word occult simply means evil. Knowing the truth is singular and objective. Because this is what natural law is. It's not open to our interpretation. We have to align our perceptions to it, not the other way around. We don't take, try to take truth and align it to our perceptions and fit it into our boxes. That's what religion does. You can't do that and claim to be awake. Knowing the true self and understanding its connection to all. We're going to talk about Christianity as being an embodiment of the law of one. The understanding that we are all part of one consciousness. Knowing that neither the physical nor the spiritual realities take precedence over each other. We are spiritual beings having a physical human experience. This does not mean that the fleshly, worldly, physical realm is unimportant and that we should just not consider it or not try to improve it. You know, we shouldn't put spirit, the spiritual realm on a pedestal above the physical world. This is the spiritual world. You're in the spiritual world now. This is, the play, this is the playground, this is the playing ground to have the experience of spirit, the physical domain. You know, matter isn't prime either. You know, you go to the opposite end of the imbalance and you think matter is prime and everything can be boiled down to, to substance and, and physical things. No, it can't. Because there is a spiritual reality that underlies matter. Neither one need to take precedence. We need to be spirits in the flesh, in the world, but not of it. Because this is where the game is played. This is where the actual learning takes place. This is where the actual action for changing things takes place. Real spirituality is being out of ego identification and ego attachment. It's about exercising true discernment and judgment, which I'm going to have a whole section on later. Being mentally free of all false religions. Knowing that there is no such thing as knowledge which is negative. No knowledge is negative. Knowledge is neutral. It's, it's what, whose hands it goes into. What is their level of consciousness and understanding? What are they going to do with that knowledge? That's what determines whether it is good or bad. It's not negative to look at something even if it's dark, even if it's scary or foreboding. If you don't look at it, you're in ignorance of it, and that's not bliss, that's spiritual death. Real spirituality is knowing the causal factors that have led to the current human condition. Again, not knowing natural law. It means Real spirituality means understanding and living in harmony with natural law. Knowing what conscience is, the difference between right and wrong behavior, and then exercising conscience by, of our own free will for ourselves, choosing right action over wrong action. <clears throat> knowing and living both pillars of enlightenment, the non-aggression principle and the self-defense principle. Knowing that all authority is an illegitimate illusion and that all government is slavery. That's one of the factors of being spiritually awake. 
How many Christians can say that? Recognizing the critical importance of free will and personal responsibility. Knowing that enlightenment is not about pursuing bliss in a world filled with suffering. You know, it's not about just saying, oh, I'm okay, so I'm going to go and have a good time. Who cares who else is suffering? That's a complete contradiction against the law of one. And there's nothing spiritual about that kind of behavior. True spirituality is about knowing what true forgiveness really means. What does turn the other cheek really mean? What is real forgiveness? We'll get to that later. It's about knowing the difference between what cannot be changed and what should be changed. Because there are things that cannot be changed, like natural law, and there are things that should be changed, like the current human condition of slavery. It's about caring enough to take real-world action to create real-world change. This is about doing. Not just about knowing. Doing has to follow the knowing. That's why I say what I'm trying to do is activate people. The knowledge comes first. Then you have to actually use it. You have to employ it. You have to put it out there in a practical application. That's what wisdom is. Wisdom is what you do with what you know. It's not the knowledge itself. True spirituality is about knowing that enlightenment is about influencing others to improve themselves. Again, another researcher recently vehemently attacked, well, not necessarily me, but really all researchers who are trying to quote-unquote wake people up and do the great work. The great work is about waking other souls up to truth. And this individual said, stop trying to wake people up. That's not your responsibility and it's, it's actually not your right. No, it's not my right to speak when others are in abject ignorance. I beg to differ. I also beg to differ that we shouldn't be teaching people the difference between right and wrong when they're clearly not in knowledge of it or don't care. Because again, I'll say it again, their ignorance is our enslavement. They affect good people with their ignorance who don't want to be enslaved and who do want to lead, lead a moral life. I have every right, every right. This has nothing to do with religion, folks. I have every right to shove this down who's ever throat. I want to continuously talk about this too. And I will continue to do that till the day I die. Okay? And that is spirituality. People don't really have the right to refuse this information because this is about our interconnected freedom. People think people have an ignorant. I'm allowed to remain ignorant of how to bake a damn good blueberry pie, okay? Or a damn good New York cheesecake. I, I am allowed to remain ignorant of those things. I am not allowed to remain ignorant of what a right is. So then I can say, I'm going to go out and violate somebody else's rights, or I'm going to just look on and do nothing while other people's rights are violated. Endlessly. Or even condone the violation of their rights. No, that, none of those things are, are rights. People don't have the right to even think that way. Because that thinking is intricately interconnected with all of our freedom, because our freedom is not individual. Unfortunately, it's collective. Very unfortunately. You can go live on your own planet, you'd have your individual freedom. While you're living on here with billions of other souls, unfortunately, your freedom is tied to theirs. And that means their ignorance of true morality affects your freedom and the freedom of other beings who want to be free. So... The people out there who say, don't try to wake people up spiritually, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. And you're completely spiritually asleep. <laughs> and finally, true spirituality means knowing that enlightenment does not e equate to perfection. Ladies and gentlemen, I am enlightened. 
but I am not perfect and never will be. And anybody expecting perfection in the physical world will be sorely disappointed. I'm the farthest thing from perfect and will be the first to tell you. But I am enlightened because enlightenment is about knowledge. It's not about living a perfect life. This is what fake-ass Buddhism will sell you on. I'm going to get into a little bit of Buddhism later too. Understanding this divide in fake Christianity versus genuine really equates to understanding the difference between the exoteric and the esoteric. Let's define the words first. The word exoteric comes from the Greek exoterikos, meaning outer, external, or on the outside of. This is a body of knowledge that is intended for or likely to be understood by the general public. It is current or popular among the general public. It relates to the outside or external, so-called external world. We're skirting the periphery with the exoteric. We're not getting into anything deep or meaningful or truly of significance or true importance. You know, the exoteric is like, you know, go to church on Sunday, put money in the collection plate, you know, say three Hail Marys and two Our Fathers and go to sleep. That's the exoteric. The word esoteric means intended in information that is intended for or likely to be understood by only a small number of people with specialized knowledge or interest. What is that specialized knowledge or interest? The occult. That's why esoteric and occult are often used interchangeably. It comes from the Greek esoterikos, which means inside or belonging to an inner circle. There is an esoteric or outer aspect of Christianity based on dogma, ritual, and astrotheological symbolism, which is specifically designed to hold people back from an accurate reception and understanding of the esoteric or inner knowledge aspects, which are the true spiritual knowledge of Christ consciousness and natural law. The dark occult priest class established all earthly religions to lure people away from an authentic spiritual way of life. Only through the rediscovery of this esoteric occult information will humanity be able to find its way back to the path of truth and enlightenment. You can never arrive at that truth and enlightenment through the exoteric pathway of world religions. You have to go far deeper into the inner core circle of the esoteric religions or traditions or philosophies and then you're going to get closer to that heart of truth, that bullseye of truth, which is about pure consciousness uh, uh, and a total accurate understanding of morality and natural law. This is a section I call fake ass everybody. <laughs> fake Christians are not a singularity. Imposters are abundant in all religions and all mystical traditions. There are countless Christians, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, Freemasons, Rosicrucians, Kabbalists, anarchists, etc., that embody their respective tradition in name only and only learn the exoteric dogma and practice and the exoteric rituals of that religion, which have little to nothing to do with the original intent or the esoteric ideals upon which that tradition was founded. There are Jews in name only that don't embody real Judaism. There are Muslims in name only that don't know what real Islam is about. And they're following a radicalized or bastardized variant of the Islamic belief system. There are Freemasons who join their lodges for networking and social benefits, but don't have the first clue regarding the esoteric philosophy or symbolism of true Freemasonry. I had a conversation with a Freemason several years ago, 32nd degree Freemason, told me 
I gave him more information about what Freemasonry is truly about in a three-hour discussion with him than in the 10 plus years that he did work in his Freemasonic Lodge system. Uh, and all the Masons he ever talked to, because they were Masons in name only. They weren't Freemasons. They were Dark Masons, or they were just ignoramus Masons. They just want to socialize, be part of a man's club, you know, think they're in the know, think they arrived and hit the big time. They don't want to study what Freemasonry really is. You know, they, they could care less about the al allegorical tradition that encompasses morality and natural law, which is what Freemasonry really teaches. Genuine Freemasonry. Not the bullshit lodge variant that's so prevalent out there today. There are imposters in every exoteric belief system. Dark occultists infused these counterfeit belief systems into every major spiritual tradition to control people's thinking to such an extent that they never come to realize the truth of their sovereignty as individuals and their collective power to co-create reality in harmony with natural law. The original esoteric foundation of all of these traditions was an allegorical and symbolical symbolic teaching of natural law, as I did a whole seminar on called Demystifying the Occult, which you may now refer to as Demystifying the Occult Part 1. It was the first part of a two-part series. To understand what I'm going to be talking about regarding true versus fake Christianity, you have to recognize that relational thinking is required. This is often about symbolism. This is about allegory and symbolism, so you have to be able to think relationally. So, I once put a symbol before a family member, the all-seeing eye, and I said, this was a symbol that was used throughout the, much of the ancient world to represent knowledge and enlightenment. And the person went, how could that be about knowledge and enlightenment? It's an eye. Could not grasp the fact that an eye with, in the triangle with light you know, radiating out from it was representative of an idea or a concept regarding knowledge. Couldn't grasp it. All they could see was the eye. They lit, their mind literally could not grasp that concept that we are relating an eye to a conceptual idea. Couldn't grasp it. That's how deadened relational thinking is in some people. I'm telling you, this is what our work is, folks. You know, I mean, you know, I say, yeah, this is fundamental stuff, but there really are people who are dumbed down to such an extent that they have a hard time grasping even the most fundamental things. Relational thinking is required to link conceptual ideas and understand that words, definitions, and symbols can have varying meanings and are subject to context. Your internal mental definition of Christianity may currently be limited to a third century Constantinian version of that tradition, meaning the church version. Those who get hung up on fixed meanings will have a lot of difficulty employing the kind of relational thinking required to understand the occult, including the esoteric variant of Christianity. Such relational thinking will apply to a range of philosophy, words, and symbols. For example, what the concept of Lucifer is and means will vary tremendously depending on whether we are discussing light Luciferianism or dark Luciferianism. Lucifer is not one thing. The concept of Lucifer, when taken in context, will change meaning in relation to which school of thought we happen to be discussing. So if you get hung up on the word, you're not going to get the concept. The word Lucifer can mean two different things, just as the word Christ can mean two different things. The word Christianity can mean two different things. We have to understand it in context and in relational thinking. Just as a, to complete that example, Lucifer in the dark variant of Luciferianism is the one who challenges the creation, 
challenges the God of creation, says, I'm going to be like the God of creation by having knowledge and wielding as a, it as a weapon and becoming like God. I will become omnipotent and all-powerful, and I will, I will wield knowledge as the light, which is what Lucifer means, looks ferry, to carry the light, to bring the light. I will bring the light for the purpose of, of control and enslavement. That's the dark Lucifer. The, what may, people may call the biblical slash Christian variant of the fallen consciousness. The fallen knowledge. Dark, using, it's the black sun using uh, knowledge as a weapon. Then there's the light Lucifer, the true light bringer, bringing the light of the creator to people to help them open up their mind and understand morality and natural law. That's light Luciferianism. So the word Lucifer, depending on context and tradition, means two entirely different things. <clears throat> People get hung up on words far too much. We have to be flexible. I'm not saying just redefine every word that exists. I'm saying when you have a symbolic concept. I know a lot of people have a problem with the word patriot. People have called me a patriot, and other people go, oh, aren't you insulted by that? No, I'm not, because I know what patriot really means and what it means to me. You know, somebody like, you know, Alex Jones, regardless of what you think of him, when he's saying rallying patriots worldwide, that doesn't just apply to the United States. So a patriot's not just somebody who just has fervor for America. Hey, there are patriots worldwide who want real freedom. Patriots are a true freedom fighter in the true sense of the word. You know, I consider one of the highest honors that was bestowed upon me. I got a, a lifetime achievement award from the Tesla Science Foundation for bringing, trying to bring Tesla's name to greater prominence. And they gave me a test of Nikola Tesla. Uh, I'm sorry, a test, a bust of Nikola Tesla. And when I was introduced to receive the award, the president of the Science Foundation said that he considered me a true American patriot. And I will take that as a high honor. I'll take that word in its true definition as a high honor. So please don't get hung up on the words here, folks. Understand the concepts. <clears throat> this is why I say knowledge, words, and symbols are not good or evil. They are tools for coming to an understanding of conceptual ideas. This is what we do, it's what we do with that knowledge through our actions that convert it into good or evil in the world. An authentic Christian realizes that all knowledge is neutral, not positive, not negative. And even occult knowledge can be used for good. It had been hidden, now we're going to take it out of hiding, we're going to de-occult it, and we're going to teach it to people to level the playing field. Now what was hidden from you, you can understand, and understand how they were manipulating as a result of understanding that knowledge. That's using occult knowledge for the right reasons. An authentic Christian uses relational thinking to study and understand the occult so that they may know natural law and align their behavior to true morality. You've got to put all the pieces of the, that great big puzzle in place, folks, to understand the big picture. The real Christ and the real Antichrist. I'm going to first explain this section from a numerological perspective. Numerology is a form of relational thinking that can be used to illustrate conceptual ideas. It is an occult um, relational thinking system. That's what numerology really is. Applying this relational thinking can allow the concept to open into a deeper understanding. Symbolism, allegory, and metaphor can also serve this purpose. A good example of this numerological relational thinking can be found in the New Testament book of Revelation in the form of the verse, let he who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of man. It is a mistranslation to translate that as the number of a man. That's not the term in Hebrew. It is the number of man, meaning mankind, humankind, Humanity. So what is the number of humanity? What do they mean by that? Let's explore what this actually means in context. In esoteric numerology, three numbers are often studied in relation to each other 
because of the concepts they have been selected to represent. Understanding this relationship can help to open up a conceptual understanding of such a biblical verse, and therefore to understand what is meant by the quote-unquote antichrist. So to understand the number 666 in the book of Revelation, you have to understand it in relationship to two other numerological, traditional, conceptual numbers. You have to understand it in relationship to 777, triple seven, and in relationship to 888. In ancient numerological systems, the number 666 was chosen to represent humanity in a state of low consciousness. This represents the beast or an antichrist mentality, the opposite of Christ consciousness, pure egotism, pure physical identification, no spirituality, dwelling in pure selfishness, dwelling in ignorance, dwelling in apathy, dwelling in non-action and um, cowardice. That's the 666. You failed in the three aspects of consciousness. And that's what these numbers represent. That's why they're all trinities. It's to represent the trinity, the holy trinity inside of us, our thoughts, our emotions, and our actions. That's why they're all triple digits. You're taking, they're taking the 888 as the divine infinity, the perfection, which man will never arrive at. Certainly not in the physical domain. Okay? The 777 is the one that stands in between God and the beast. That's the man in as perfected of a state, or at least as developed spiritually of a state as he's going to get in the physical world. This is that Christ consciousness that we're talking about, being in the world but not of it. The 777 traditionally represented humanity embodying a higher level of consciousness, or Christ consciousness, being in the world but not of it. The word Christ is actually derived from the Greek Christos, meaning morally good, virtuous, or holy. This is why they put 777 on the jackpot machines, the, uh, the um, uh, slot machines in the casino. It's a very interesting. I, I've, I've done quite a bit in my life, actually. I, I'll give you a qu quick a anecdote here. I actually used to work for a technology company in Princeton, New Jersey, big occult think tank center on the eastern seaboard, actually. Um, and um, I worked for a popular technology company, which I will not name, but uh, I was their lead Macintosh technician. And this is probably the biggest, one of the bigger tech companies in central New Jersey. I was their lead Mac technician, and they would always send me to Atlantic City and to, uh, not Vineland, um, uh, Pleasantville. It's called Pleasantville, New Jersey. Okay? This is where there's a company that makes all of the Atlantic City slot machines. I won't mention the name of it, but they make almost all of the slot machines for Atlantic City casinos. And I worked in, the, I, I supported computers in the graphic department of that business and troubleshot the, the graphics that they put on the slot machines. So I would see this all over the place. Like 777 was just everywhere in this business, you know. And, you know, I, I understood then what it meant. And, you know, this is why they put these numbers on the slot machines. They're trying to sell you on something that they know that very deep nested in your subconscious, you, you know, has been traditionally used to represent spirituality, high-level spirituality. They know that's what people crave, but yet are missing, and that's what they sell you in proxy, so that they can just keep all that wealth flowing to them. 888 always represented in numerological traditions the threefold infinity, the creator, natural law, perfection in the absolute, which man is not and never will be. Humanity cannot be the 888, for there is no such thing as perfection in the flesh. But we can become the 777, the one who embodies natural law, a herald for natural law, who embodies Christ consciousness, who is morally good, virtuous, holy, if you will, meaning whole, 
not divided amongst themselves, not torn apart by the adversarial consciousness of the 666, the beast, the divider, the opposer, Satan in Hebrew. We can become the 777 when we work on ourselves and purify thought, emotion, and action. The three aspects of consciousness, the divine trinity within us. When humanity remains spiritually unconscious, they can be said in the numerological tradition to embody the number 666, representing failure in thought, emotion, and action, the three aspects of human consciousness. This is why 666 is considered the number of the beast, the satanic or antichrist consciousness. The people of this world who dwell in ignorance, apathy, laziness, and cowardice are savages or beasts from a true spiritual perspective. And their consciousness essentially exists only in the animal slash reactive mind. They are the true antichrist, the beast, and their thoughts and behaviors work continually to kill the true Christ consciousness. And this is what is meant in the book of Revelation by he who has understanding will calculate the number of the beast because it is, for it is the number of mankind. Mankind dwells in satanic consciousness, in antichrist consciousness, which is why we're enslaved and not free. In the aggregate, let me caveat that by saying, there are people who do dwell in the Christ consciousness, there are people who are on their way to dwelling in that higher level of consciousness. They're on that path. But the, in the aggregate, humanity is still a beast. Christian prophecies foretell of an antichrist, a false impersonator Christ, who will come and deceive the whole world during the end of days. Understood properly, this concept translates to the people who are falsely claiming to embody Christ and the ideals of Christ. The Antichrist is not one person. The real Antichrist is a way of thinking, feeling, and acting. False modern-day Christianity has brought this massive deception to fruition because they're peddling what they say is Christ consciousness and it has nothing whatsoever to do with the real article. Today, the greater body of those who claim to be quote-unquote Christian actually embody the antithesis of Christ consciousness. Fake ass Christians are the Antichrist. So let's look at who made this false religion, the false variant of Christianity. Again, it is what I rep uh, refer to as the cult of the black sun. Those who have knowledge of how the universe really works and how the human psychology really works but are wielding that as a weapon. Therefore, they have the sun, but they have the black sun. This is what I call this dark solar cult that really rules the world. This hidden priest class of sorcerers, mental sorcerers. <clears throat> Our planet has been ruled for thousands of years by a dark solar priest class. This cult has no name to which it actually is actually referred to by its own members. They don't call themselves the Illuminati. They don't call themselves the Black Sun. They don't have a name for themselves. They just are, and they just do what they do. When I was involved in Satanism, folks, they didn't go, uh, we're the cult of the Black Brotherhood of the Ram. Uh, nothing of the sort. They never named themselves. It's the cult without a name. And it's worldwide. And it's every ostensible denomination of faiths. It's every race. It's every culture. It's every uh, monetary class, financial class, believe it or not. People think, oh, it's only rich men enslaving the world. Yeah, that's what you think. And it's women too, folks, before we say it's just all men. No, there are ruthless women in the, in the dark priestess class. And believe me, they hold a lot of influence in it. There were 
women involved in Satanism that were a lot higher on the occult hierarchy than a lot of the men. So it's, it's all, it's everybody. It's not one group of people. It's not white men, rich people, Jews, Freemasons, no. It's dark occultists come from all walks of life and every continent on the face of the earth. This cult has no name to which it is referred by its own members, but some people refer to it quite wrongly as the Illuminati. I take exception with them being called the Illuminati. Want to know why? I'm the Illuminati. You are the Illuminati. The people in this room are the Illuminati. Illuminati comes from the Greek meaning illuminated ones. It's a plural word. It means those who are illuminated with knowledge. But why would you want to apply a positive term like that to these jackasses in the dark occult? I keep trying to tell people, if you're enlightened, you're the Illuminati. You're the enlightened ones. Not them. They're not spiritually enlightened. They may be enlightened about how to manipulate people, but that doesn't mean that they've reached spiritual enlightenment. I say that term is wrongly applied to this cult because the truly illuminated would never behave in the way these dark sorcerers behave. Their cult uses light or knowledge of the human psyche and the laws of nature against the masses of people who are in ignorance of such knowledge in order to control and enslave them. This is why this cult has also been called the Black Sun, the cult of dark knowledge. They invented the world religions. I keep trying to tell this to people who are involved with religion in whatever capacity. It's like, oh, no, 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 no. They created all the other religions. They didn't create my religion. They made Islam and Judaism, but they didn't make Christianity. And then somebody who subscribes to Islam say, yeah, they, they, they gave a fake variant of, of Judaism and Christianity, but they didn't touch Islam. And then the Jews will say, no, they, they, they gave the Christians and, and, the, and the Islamists a, a, a total false religion, but the Judaic religion remained completely true and preserved. Yeah, okay. Everybody wants to take their prejudice into the truth. That's the problem. Can't be done. Not if you're really being honest with yourself and you really want to go far down the path of truth and enlightenment. You could do that and lie to yourself and say, oh, I'm making progress and I'm taking my religion with me. Good luck with that. The Flavians and early Christianity. The Flavians were a ruling bloodline sect of the dark solar cult who ruled the Roman Empire during much of its existence. The Flavians developed a problem controlling the population of the Roman Empire because some segments of the people they ruled were beginning to gain knowledge of the illegitimacy of being ruled and wanted to be free. This is what overt controlling dynasties usually degenerate into. When you have overt control, the people know that they're oppressed and ruled. The Romans beat people into submission with their centurions. You know, you didn't submit to their ruling authority, they just ran you through with a sword and, and crew or crucified you. Everyone knew they were just a gang of thugs that said, we're God, we rule, you're going to do what we say or die, which is what the, that, the mafia of their time. They were the mafia of their time. Just like government is the mafia of our modern time. But when you have an overt rulership like that, everybody sees it. And they're like, oh yeah, piss off the Romans and they're going to run you through with a sword. You know, so eventually they say, we don't want to live like this. We want to be free. And they openly revolt physically. That was the problem that was going on in the early Roman Empire. because of certain philosophical knowledge that was spreading among the peasant or slave population. This period of time was known as the crisis of the third century. Oh my God, it was a crisis. Freedom was breaking out. How can, we can't have that. We gotta go back into enslavement immediately. This is a crisis. This is what the ruling class, of course, called it. The crisis of the third century. 
This, quote, crisis in human thought had developed in Egypt centuries before. This earlier awakening was driven by a resurgence of the Egyptian mystery traditions, really the Kemetian mystery traditions, much older than the Egyptian mystery traditions. And again, um, the word Egypt actually comes from hygeptos, which means the place of the spirit of the Ta. That's what the word literally means. It was Memphis, the, the capital of Egypt. And the older word for all of Egypt was Kem, meaning the land of the black, the black land for the effluvial soils of the Nile, which turned the soil black and made it fertile. So, you know, the Kemetian mystery tradition, named after the land of Kem, were older than the newer Egyptian mysteries that the Greeks took into the Roman Empire when uh, the Ptolemies and uh, uh, other uh, later Egyptian kings were eventually absorbed into the Roman Empire. So this earlier resurgence in thought and spiritual awakening was driven by a resurgence in the mystery traditions being taught at Alexandria. These mystery traditions were, of course, the spiritual core of esoteric Christian thought. Okay? Again, part of where, where this was happening, this outbreak in, it was like a, a renaissance of that day, okay, was happening in Alexandria. And this is Hypatia, who was one of the female teachers at, at Alexandria. Okay, she taught in one of the places known as the Serapeum, which was an adjunct to the Library of Alexandria. This is a movie that was made about her life and teachings and death called Agora. And Agora means a free and open market, a free way of interacting with other people a, on a voluntary basis. One of the best movies you will ever see. How many people here have seen this movie? Yeah, this is why. That's it. They don't want you to see this movie. Do not want you to see this movie. Okay? They really don't want the idea uh, that, of, of freedom that's contained within it out there. They certainly don't want the idea of a truly empowered anarchistic type female out there. That's the last thing they want to push in Hollywood. Okay? So this movie got buried. Buried. Hard. They really tried to keep it out of public consumption. Believe me. Watch it you will thank me for recommending it. It's a phenomenal movie. It's a very sad, depressing movie, though, I have to tell you, because it ultimately is about how this ruling class destroyed knowledge. But it's so worth seeing. It's so worth seeing. You will, you'll love it. And, you know, uh, we need more women in the world today like Hypatia. Anyway... The mystery traditions were, of course, the spiritual core of esoteric Christian thought in early Christianity. But such a mentality catching on with the masses of people, the peasant classes, certainly would not serve the psychopathic ruling class of the Roman Empire. That ruling class had already dealt with the Jewish rebellions a century earlier. And they needed a plan to snuff out this new rebellion in thought before it became a more widespread problem. So they were already dealing with countless Jewish rebellions all over the Roman Empire. The Jews didn't want to be ruled by the Romans. And this is what was happening around the first century AD, when Jesus is said to have lived. And a lot of people would suggest that his teachings were fomenting these physical rebellions in the Roman Empire. So they needed a plan. They're like, my God, they're not buying into our old lies and deception and disinformation and and, uh, you know, uh, propaganda anymore, and they're not really respecting even our forceful control. They're, they're really trying to break their minds free. So we, this is a crisis, and we really need to do something about it. And boy, did they. The Flavians' own astrotheology-based religion was devoted to a solar deity called Sol Invictus, the unconquerable sun. These solar cult members sought to unify the Roman Empire under a common state-run religion by challenging the problematic early Christian philosophy, by, sorry, changing 
the problematic early Christian philosophy to reflect the myths of their own astrotheological solar god, which they themselves inherited from even older solar cult traditions. This just goes way, way back, folks. I mean, you can go back to Tammuz of uh, Tammuz and or Nimrod of uh, Babylon. You know, you can go to the Zoroastrian tradition. You could go to, um, uh, uh, in, in, as depicted here, um, Serapis uh, of Egypt. You can go to Horus and Osiris, which are solar figures of Egypt. And there's countless solar myth hero figures throughout history. Because again, the sun represented light, knowledge, enlightenment, spirituality. And there were, you know, hero saviors who, you know, conquered the darkness within themselves and thus conquered the darkness of the night through the resurrecting sun. This is where this whole allegorical myth came from. At the bottom of this image here, you see Sol Invictus depicted, depicted on a Roman coin of this time period. The continuity of this solar deity mythos can be observed in the stories and characteristics of gods like Mithra, Zoroaster, Dionysus, Horus, Osiris, Serapis, and many, many, many others. It's a laundry list. There's probably hundreds of solar deities throughout the centuries. So let's look at the Piso family influence on this Roman changing of early esoteric Christianity into the exoteric Roman church variant of Christianity. The hugely influential Piso family of the Calpurnian bloodline of Rome had already been at work on the Roman Empire's Christian problem. And here we're talking about the real Christians, the ones who really understood sovereignty and wanted to be free. And we're employing the original allegoric and parable style teachings of Jesus to teach people about real freedom. They were at work on the empire's Christian problem since the mid first century AD when the Pisos began to lay the foundations of the new state religion designed to control people's thought and suppress further rebellion against the authority of the ruling class. This religion was designed to instill in people the promise of a better afterlife, the fear of hell, and a masochistic philosophy of subjugation for the slave class. To crush the growing rebellion in consciousness once and for all, the Flavian and Neo-Flavian dynasties of the Roman Empire knew that the empire would ultimately need to be united under such a state-controlled religious belief system. This is how they were going to subvert the original teachings and essentially bring people back under their mind control. So here's the solution that they came up with and the puppet that they gave it to to introduce. Constantine, quote unquote, the Great, who was born Flavius Valerius Aurelius. And again, you see here, he came from the Flavian dynasty. All the emperors from the Flavian and Neo-Flavian dynasty began, were actually born Flavians. So he was, his first name was Flavius. He would ultimately take up the task of bringing to fruition the new Roman state-controlled religion. In 325 AD, Constantine held the Council of Nicaea, where exoteric religious leaders of the time were held under duress to develop a Rome-sanctioned legal religion suitable for the masses. And I call this Constantinianity, or Constantinianity. Okay? It's not Christianity, this is the religion of Constantine, or at least the religion that the, the true dark priest class of his day gave to him to introduce. You know, it's like calling the modern Levian form of Satanism Levaism. You know, it's, it, it's not really his. He didn't come up with Levian Satanism on his own. He was given the satanic underlying ideology and told, Concrest this and put this into a book for the masses to read. 
This is the same thing Constantine did. That was his charge by his dark occult brethren. That was what he was tasked to do. Just like LaVey was tasked to give people the modern form of Satanism. So he gathered all these cardinals and bishops and put them in a council under duress. They were held there under Roman centurion guard. And he said, you are going to invent a religion that is going to be capable of mind controlling the masses back to subservience or you will not leave this room alive. Literally, that's what he did. Under his orders. So, they came together to develop a Rome-sanctioned legal religion suitable for the masses. This council would invent today's modernized version of Christianity with Jesus portrayed as the Son of God. They invented this divinity aspect of Jesus. He was no longer a teacher, a rabbi, someone who was preaching morality and natural law. Now he was the Son of God because he was to take up the role of Sol Invictus, the unconquerable Son of God of the Roman religion. They're just substituting out one God for the other to give people a low-level, watered-down variant of their religion to believe in. They also invented the highly censored text of the canonized Bible, which eliminated and suppressed hundreds of books of spiritual and esoteric information, including the Nag Hammadi Library, which we'll talk about. Their job was to erase the truth and feed the population lies. They were what you might call the modern media of their day. This is a depiction of the Council of Nicaea with Constantine ruling as the king in the front being uh, consulted there by one of the priests. The Nicene Council weeded out any knowledge which spoke of spirituality that was forbidden by the ruling class. Some of the concepts censored by them included any mention of the soul, of soul reincarnation over multiple lifetimes. That was all ripped away from canon scriptures. You were not allowed to even conceptualize the notion under this new religion that death was not the end of consciousness or simply the end of living in this realm or coming back here and you would just immediately go to some other afterlife. Because they wanted the idea that it was one and done. They didn't want the idea sticking around that we could learn things and have experiences through multiple lifetimes in the physical domain. They also purged the idea of each individual's intercessor-free connection to the creator and creation. They wanted you to have an intercessor between you and the, quote, divine, between you and God. You had to go through a priest in the new state-sanctioned religion. They also eradicated the already pre-existing notion of women's equality with men in their right to teach spiritual knowledge, or in other words, exist as part of a priest class or a teaching class, a spiritual teaching class. Women are just as adept at doing this as any man can be. Yet this new religion was a form of patriarchal control because it subjugated women and forbade them from being in the priest class. These were just some among many esoteric ideas they censored, which came largely in the canonical elimination of a whole body of early Gnostic scriptural information known as the Nag Hammadi Library. As if this wasn't bad, a bad enough setback to early Christian philosophical thought, their most devastating blow would be delivered in their bastardizing of the scriptures by adding, adding in completely untrue enemy provisions to their finalized canon. And of course, I am referring to the infamous Romans 13. And once again, please note the name of the book, ladies and gentlemen. Romans. The canon, Romans 13, the canonizing of the authority of man. Here's what Romans 13 actually says. Now just, okay, I'm going to read 
Romans 13, verse 1 through 7, in its entirety. Listen to this sheer bullshit. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist, otherwise saying the powers that be, have been established by God. Whoever rebels against the authorities is rebelling against what God has instituted and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to those who do right, but they are a terror to those who do wrong. Do rulers a terror to the wrongdoers? You could have fooled me. Do you want to be free from your fear of the authorities? Then do what is right and they will praise you. Oh yeah, the government's going to praise you for doing the right thing. Yeah. I'm, I'm They're just heaping mounds of praise on me all day long. Do what is right and they will praise you. For the authorities are God's servants for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For the rulers do not wield their sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, sent to bring punishment on the wrongdoers. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also purely as a matter of conscience, because it is the right thing to do. This is why you pay your taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to them what you owe to them. Taxes, respect, fear, and honor. That is scriptural text that exists in the Bible. Imagine these people think they are God on earth. They love their thrones. They love their crowns and their thrones and their gold. They're holy people. This is what this is what jackass priests would tell you are holy people. They'll say the government is ordained of God. I guarantee you, you go and just sit out, go sit, stand outside a traditional church of any denomination in America, okay, and just say, how do you rectify the idea of the authority of God and, and the authority in man called government? And I guarantee you, those people will say government is ordained of God. I guarantee it. This is how brainwashed they are. Look at this psychopath. <laughs> saying he's a holy man with the amount of riches. The 18, I'm sorry, what am I talking about? Yeah, about $18 trillion in wealth that the Vatican is actually sitting on. $18 trillion with a T, not billion dollars, trillion. I think the entire money supply of the entire earth is like $90 trillion, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90 trillion, something like that. It's how much money exists on the earth. They have 18 trillion of it. Let me tell you something. Any person that would believe that this is what the God of creation would sanction is not only spiritually bankrupt, they are mentally ill and don't even belong walking the streets. They belong in an insane asylum. If that's what your God demands of me, fuck your God. How's that? Can it get any plainer than that? 
No. The God of creation wants me and everyone else to be free. They don't want us subject and slaves to other men and women. Which is a bullshit, immoral, illusory notion. Okay, so I'll, I'll say it plain and simply what other, people's don't have, other people don't have the balls to say. Since no one else will say it, I'll say it. It's, it's getting real now. And yet, these imbeciles just dwell in this total cognitive dissonance. They don't even think of this. Doesn't even occur to them, doesn't even enter their thoughts, doesn't even enter their thought process. They don't even understand how it's a complete contradiction of their own scriptural message that you cannot serve two masters. They think, oh, what, this is only about government, I'm sorry, this is only about their religion and money. Well, if you can't serve two masters and that's about God or mammon, what if we interject another master called man into the equation in the form of government? Can you serve two masters then? No, this doesn't even occur to them as being a completely nonsensical, contradictory idea. Because they don't have logical thinking skills because people who hold fervently to a religious belief have burned the logical circuits in their brain long time ago. How do modern Christians attempt to reconcile the clear and glaring contradiction of the notion of authority being vested in mankind through government when their very own religion demands that they recognize God as the only authority? The answer, they just ignore it altogether like it doesn't exist. They don't even want to answer that question. You can't serve two masters and you can't walk with God and hold hands with Satan at the same time. It doesn't work that way, folks. And government is a great Satan if there ever was one. All government. Astrotheology, the new religion, is the old religion. Quite literally, because that is one of the terms that the dark occult do use for their religion. They don't have a name for it. They simply refer to it as the old religion because it is the religion from which everything else and all other religions were derived. The exoteric religion of Christianity is based in astrotheology, a pre existing mythos regarding the, astro, the astrological bodies in the heavens the sun, the moon, the planets, and the stars. Now, for how many people here are familiar with the concept of astrotheology by show of hands? Almost everybody. That's great. So you'll, you'll, you'll have no problem with this section. Many false Christians will have a very big problem with this section. But uh, I recommend people uh, study astrotheology. And uh, if you want to uh, get a more extensive breakdown of it, you can watch my What on Earth is Happening four-part series. Specifically, I believe I break down astrotheology in part two of that series. So, astrotheology is based upon the sun, the moon, the planets, and the stars. The exoteric Christian tradition is specifically based upon the astrotheological solar cult, the cult of the sun. That's what Jesus represents, the sun of the ancient world. In the modern variant, Jesus takes up the role of the Son, the hero, savior, rejuvenator of the world, because that's what the Son is. The Son rejuvenates the world each day. And it also rejuvenates the world during springtime when it rises from the southern hemisphere into the northern hemisphere. The astrotheological variant of Christianity, complete with all its solar ritualistic trappings, was created to lead genuine Christians astray from truth so they would never attain authentic Christ consciousness. This is the fake form of Christianity practiced by most modern-day Christians. They are worshiping the sun. The sun has been traditionally used as a symbol of knowledge and truth since time immemorial. The sun was seen in the ancient world as a representation of the light of the creator, or knowledge, which has to be taken into oneself in the form of moral knowledge or conscience in order to nurture right action in harmony with natural law. And that's what is referred to as the exercise of conscience. See, conscience is the knowledge. The exercise of conscience is the action 
that we take based on the knowledge of the difference between right and wrong. This true path to freedom lies in knowing, not believing. Dogma, faith, and belief, on the other hand, are all hallmarks of the false Christian, quote-unquote, religion, which grew out of the distorted astrotheological form of the original esoteric variant of Christianity. A book I recommend is The World's 16 Crucified Saviors, Christianity Before Christ, which examines 16 solar cult, solar hero, savior, rejuvenator myths throughout the ancient world. I'm not going to go over all of astrotheology here today. It's too big of a concept. I'm not going to go over through what I cover and what on earth is happening in the series. I'm just going to briefly talk about how Jesus represents the sun on the cross here. Okay, this is the symbol of modern day Christianity. The cross, the circle around it, that's the sun on the cross of the zodiac. The sun makes its journey all around the zodiac from the spring equinox up to the summer solstice where it's at the height of its power or the, the, the hottest point in the year which we just passed on December 21st. Then it falls in the summer, I'm sorry, in the uh, autumn equinox all the way down to when it dies on the cross during the winter solstice. So this is the lowest point of power of the sun in the northern hemisphere. And this is when it is said to die on the cross. Then it comes back to life. It resurrects from the tomb of the southern hemisphere and it comes back into the northern hemisphere after Easter, which is right after the spring equinox, the first Sunday, the sun's day, after the first full moon, because the moon lunar goddess has to give birth to the solar god. That's the Holy Spirit or the Divine Mother, Mary, gives birth to the sun god, okay? And then it makes its way back up to the high point of power again at the summer solstice. And it dies around the winter solstice, which is December 21st, just before Christmas. Comes back to life at the spring equinox, right around Easter time. East star, the eastern star that rises in the east is the sun. This is what Christianity is all based upon. It's all astrotheology. The exoteric form. Okay? You could then see the esoteric form even in the astrotheology. Because this is an allegory of truth. Truth goes into the shadows. It has to be reborn and de-occulted and brought back up into life for all to see and then reach its high point of power where it becomes common sense and everybody employs it through their action. And that's what the savior of the world is, truth. That's why Jesus was referred to as the way, truth, and life. That's what this is about. It's an allegorical tradition about knowledge and truth. And in that sense, that's where I align myself with the esoteric tradition, which is what true Christianity is. The Vatican actually has a solar zodiac with the, the phallus of Osiris, okay? A obelisk, an Egyptian obelisk, representing the solar deity Osiris in the middle of the zodiac cross, the, the, the great cross and lesser crosses of the zodiac, which define the solstices and equinoxes versus the great cross, which defines the mid-season, the mid-point points of the seasons, which are the actual uh, occult religious Sabbaths, the main Sabbaths being um, May 1st or um, Valpurgisnacht, um, uh, August 1st or Lamas, October 31st or uh, Hollow Mass, Halloween, and February 2nd, which is Candle Mass or Imbolc. These are the astrotheological holidays of the ancient world, and they're right there at the Vatican at St. Peter's Square with the sun in the middle and the symbol of the sun, the phallic uh, obelisk of, of Osiris right in the middle of the square. Can't be more blatant, and people can't see it. Or don't want to see it. They don't want to acknowledge that that's what that is, is all there for. They've given us their religion. That's all the dark occult does. They don't invent anything new. They take what already existed and then they just morph it and twist it. They don't have any real creative power. Da Vinci encoded the story of astrotheology into the Last Supper painting. You know, Jesus is the sun in the middle 
You have a light season. I'm sorry, you have a light season on the right-hand side there, and you have a dark season. The light season is when the sun is in the northern hemisphere, and the dark season is when the sun is in the southern hemisphere. You know, the, the, there's four groupings of three disciples seated at the Last Supper table, representing the three months of each season. Summer, spring, in the light or northern hemisphere, and then autumn and winter in the what they called the season of death, where plants and food don't really grow in the northern hemisphere. When the sun's in the southern hemisphere, that's the time of darkness. He encoded it all into this, among many other things. Brilliant, brilliant, you know, scholar, artist, inventor, and, you know, clearly you could see he had his way with depicting symbology, if one has the consciousness to decode it. But it's all right there. It's all right in front of us. The trinities of the ancient world. You know, the old religions became the new religion. There were trinities throughout time and memorial, the same way as there were sun gods. You had Semiramis, Nimrod, and Tammuz. Tammuz the sun god, Semiramis the goddess, Nimrod the god. That's God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son. See, the Holy Spirit, that's the, the feminine aspect of creation, the, the goddess aspect. See, she's Mary in the Christian tradition, but she's actually removed from the divine trinity. This is another part of the patriarchalization of exoteric Christianity, removing women and even uh, female symbolism from their entire set of dogma and symbology. So now you have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit ghosted. The feminine has been ghosted from the trinity. She's now the spirit represented as the dove. See, what, it, what, she, what this really represents, or, and just to complete this, on the right-hand side there, you have the Egyptian trinity. You have Osiris, the god, creator god, and then you have Horus, the sun god, and Isis, Isis, the, the lunar goddess. And the lunar goddess, or the feminine aspect, has to give birth to the divine male aspect. That's the child. Because what these three aspects all really are are thought, emotion, and action again. The true Holy Trinity that exists within us. The Creator God is our thoughts, which create. Creates the manifestation through what we think, and then that becomes what we experience. Our emotions, that's the divine feminine aspect that is an internal quality and based on feeling and intuition. And then that those combined, the 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 male and female combined, the creator God and the feminine, the goddess, create and give birth to right action in the world through knowledge and care. It's a beautiful allegorical system if it's decoded and understood, understood properly. But most people don't understand it. They want to actually, you know, make it literal. So even the astrotheological aspect of it, you're giving birth to the light through your knowledge and care. That's what gives birth to the light. And that's then the way, truth, and life which leads to freedom. And Christians can't even see it as such. They don't understand the symbolism that's encoded into their own religion. But again, this was not really done to give people the deep esoteric trappings, the deep esoteric understanding. It was done to give them the exoteric trappings and get them to believe in the literal interpretation of this. That's what pulled people off the real spiritual path of esoteric Christianity. It's all astrotheology, folks. What, even if you're looking at it from the exoteric or esoteric side. And all the religions are based on astrotheology, not just Christianity. Every religion, I call them the desert sky god religions. You have in the first column the, the name of the ancient astrotheological cult. You had the cult of the sun, the cult of the moon, and the cult of the stars and planets. The solar cult, lunar cult, and stellar cult. Then you have their associated revered celestial object or symbol. Okay, you have the sun for the solar cult, the moon for the lunar cult, the stars and planets for the stellar cult. And again, Saturn is the primary planet that was considered the king of the planets because it's the farthest out that can be seen with the naked human eye. 
The solar cult applies to modern Christianity with its symbol being the sun on the cross of the zodiac. The lunar cult of the moon was given to Islam and its symbol of in its modern religious variant is the moon. And the stellar cult, the cult of the stars, was given to Judaism and its symbol is a star. I mean, it's all right there out in the open, in the symbology, and people still can't see it. And I've been, I've been teaching this for 10 years. Michael Tessarion's been teaching it for 15 to 20 years. Jordan Maxwell's been teaching it for God knows how long. I don't know how that man... If I was teaching this for as long as he was, I'd be completely insane. How could you do the same thing for as long as that man has done it? And see, people still don't get it after 50 goddamn years. I mean, I'd be ready to slip my wrists. It's, not, it's, not, it's comical, but it's not really funny because I consider him a genuine teacher who understands all this stuff. And yet, you know, it's like he's been going for 50 years. I, I wonder, like, you know, am I going to be doing this for that long and people still not getting it? Because I'm going to be absolutely horrified. I already am horrified that I'm doing it for 10 and people aren't getting it. <clears throat> Attributes of ancient celestial cults were assigned to each of the major religions thousands of years ago. There were the three major astrotheological bodies, the sun, astrological bodies, the sun that rules, which rules the day, the moon, which rules the night, and the stars and planets. Christianity was assigned the solar cult, the sun or son of God, symbolized by the cross of the zodiac. The lunar cult was assigned to Islam, symbolized by the moon. Um, I'm sorry, um, the day of worship, too, uh, in the solar religion of Christianity is Sunday. Now, even the days of the week correspond to these astrotheological symbols. The lunar cult was assigned to Islam, symbolized by the moon, with its day of worship on Friday needs a little bit more background to understand why Friday represents the moon, but the name in the Norse tradition for the lunar goddess was Freya, after which Friday is named. And then Judaism was assigned to the stellar or planetary cult, which was worshipped on Saturn's day, or Saturday, with a star as its symbol. Uh, it can't get more blatant. You know, and yet you could show this to a religionist and they'll be like, oh, that's just a coincidence. The goal of all false religion is to supplant the fundamental underlying truth of natural law. Bottom line, all religion is designed to do just that. They want you to believe in something that has nothing to do with true morality and not understand natural law because that's the only way you can continue to be enslaved. When a person uses their free will as the gift that it is to learn and grow spiritually, they can align their actions with natural law. Exoteric religious beliefs are instilled to subvert an individual's own inner recognition and journey of spiritual discovery of alignment with true morality. This ultimately severely distorts their understanding of what actions are rights under moral law that do not create chaos versus what actions are wrongs which breed chaotic consequences for everyone. That's why they gave us an astrotheologically based religion and not the real thing, which is based in true morality and natural law. The worldview of our rulers. Dark Luciferianism occultists have controlled this world for thousands of years by using their own deep knowledge of the occult and natural law and by inventing false world religions for the ignorant masses over whom they rule. It is very important to understand their overarching worldview, for we must grasp the mindset of those who currently enslave us if we hope to end their rulership and truly be free. You have to know the enemy, folks. You have to know. This is another thing people say, I don't need to know that. I don't believe in that. Utter nonsense. Other people believe in these beliefs and are acting upon these beliefs, and you do need to know how they think. That's like saying, listen, I'm stepping in the ring with this cage fighter tonight. I don't need to know anything about his strategy, what tools he brings to the table, what he's capable of doing. Don't need to know it. You know, I'll just get in there and flail away. Yeah. That's how, that's how somebody who's really in a true fight works. 
They don't try to fight with their mind and understand the strategy and mentality of their opponent. They just go in there and flail away. Yeah. It's very important to understand their worldview, okay? These dark occultists fully understand that the universe is governed by spiritual laws put in place by the creator, the underlying intelligence of the universe. And they are in open rebellion against those universal moral laws. They know that these laws exist to constrict behavior and bring chaotic consequence for bad behavior. They know this. So how do they work their way around it? If they're currently still ruling and getting people to do their bidding, okay, and they're still owning other people, and they're still you know, at the top of the so-called food chain when it comes to ruling others, having them in slavery, and them as the ruling class being more free than other people, how are they getting away with this? How is it the universe catching up with them? They believe that because moral or natural law is in place in the universe, that the entire universe itself is a prison because they cannot do whatever they want and get away with it without consequence. This is the real dark occult worldview. You boil it down to its essence. Here's what they believe. They believe we're in a prison, that they're in a prison, because they know that the universe is governed by moral law, and they themselves cannot do whatever they want without consequence. That's what they want. They want a realm that anything goes, and they can do whatever they want, subvert anyone's rights, harm anyone's physical body, however much they want, and get away with it unscathed completely. Like cosmically, karmically unscathed. Now, since they realize that is not the reality in which they live, they consider the entire universe a prison for them. And so to openly rebel against the law that is inherent to this domain, they've made a conscious choice to say, we will never accept the moral law. And we will be in open rebellion against it by getting other people to do our bidding and our dirty work for us. And that's how we'll escape the karmic consequence. And that's how they can get away with it and keep doing it. They think that it's a prison just because they're subject to law. They don't understand that the moral law is in place for our full benefit, for our uplift, for our freedom, for our growth and learning, and for our, our absolute optimum conditions in, in the physical world. They want to be God on, they want to rule in the prison that they consider hell of this world, rather than serve in what could be a paradise, a heaven, if they only capitulate to moral law. So this worldview has been personified in stories of Satan, Lucifer, Rebel angels, fallen angels, demons, archons, the Antichrist, and other anti-God archetypes who refuse to be bound by any moral standards and attempt to control creation by manipulating people into total ignorance so that that ruling class can become God. This psychopathic and megalomaniacal priest class consider those who are ignorant, apathetic, and lacking the will and courage to change the human condition to be spiritually dead. And this is what they call people. This is what the dark occultists that I worked with in the past referred to the average population of the planet. They called human beings the dead. That was their name for human beings. The dead. And their rationale went like this. If you're not using your intelligence, the thought aspect of consciousness is deadened. If you're not using your care, then the emotional aspect of consciousness is deadened. And if you're lazy, apathetic, and cowardly, and you don't take right real-world action, then the actions component of consciousness is dead. And therefore, if someone is dead in thought, emotion, and action, their entire consciousness is dead, and therefore the being can be said not to be truly alive. 
They're just a flesh robot that they can do whatever they want to, like property. That is their rationale for how they will treat other human beings. And to be honest with you, I can't necessarily say that I fully disagree with the reasons for them coming to those conclusions. I just disagree with their methodology and think that they're wrong for the way they behave, but people are the dead. The vast majority of the people of Earth can be legitimately described as these dark occultists describe them, sadly. Again, not saying that in a bitter, vicious way, just saying that's the truth. They're not lying in that regard. Most people do not have an activated thought process, emotional aspect, or the, and they're not active. So they are the 666, the beast, or the dead. How do they deflect their karmic consequence? This is their dirty little secret. High-level dark occultists, knowing about the existence and operation of natural law, understand that they cannot outright break it and get away unscathed. So just how do they accomplish their objectives, objectives successfully without being fully held karmically to account for their actions? They quote-unquote get away with their evil scheming and planning because at the very base level, they themselves are not actually performing the actions. They're not the ones doing it. They're not performing the actions they command to others to do. They get their minions, their mind-controlled slaves, their cult members, their order followers to do their dirty work for them by manipulating them through fear and ignorance into breaking moral law for them. Thus, the dark occultists shield themselves to a significant degree from the brunt of karmic consequence while their ignorant order followers inherit the lion's share of moral culpability and karmic debt. No order follower is a true Christian because true Christians follow conscience, not orders. And this is what people who claim to be Christians need to get through their damn thick skulls. No one who goes and follows someone else's orders in any capacity is a Christian or living like Christ. Stop blaspheming the name of your own God that you claim to believe in. Order followers can never be true Christians. It's impossible. A true Christian takes free will behavior based on the knowledge of conscience. They exercise conscience by choosing right action over wrong action because they themselves know the difference. They're not listening to other people about what they tell them to do, listening to other people regarding what they've been told to do. You tell me what to do, I'm going to laugh in your face. I'll do what I want based on whether I know it's right or not. And that's it. That's the only reason I take action. Not because somebody told me to do something. And this is beyond the mentality of a child. There's a legitimate reason for a child to listen to what a parent is saying because the parent has more uh, experience through their years of life and knowledge that they've gathered. That's why a, a child is considered a steward up to that certain age that they can really gain enough life experience and, and rational thought process you know, to be able to really know the difference between right and wrong and then strike out on their own. That's what proper conscious parenting is supposed to be about instilling in the child. Not instilling obedience in them, just saying, I do it just because I said to do it. You know, then this goes out into being, this goes out into, into, into being the rationale why people do things just because the church said to do it or just because the state said to do it. Here is what, how the, the dark occultists of the world get away with almost scot-free in karma. Because they have their dogs on a leash doing their dirty work for them. Perfect representation of how the karmic debt is avoided and who it flows to. Because it's not going to the guy in the top hat and tuxedo. It's going to the cop eating out of the, the money out of the dog bowl. That's who's getting held to karmic account in creation for their wrongdoing behavior.
So who's really at the top of this dark occult food chain? Everybody always asks me this question, so I'm going to answer it. Oh, is it the Freemasons, Mark? Is it the Rosicrucians? Is it, you know, is it the Jews? You know, everybody wants to know, oh, who's really the highest level? Want to know where, I, I've said, I said it in my, uh, I believe it was my Demystifying the Occult 2 seminar. The world is not run from Washington, D.C., London, and Tokyo. Sorry, folks, not the cities that control the world. The cities that control the world are the Vatican in Rome, Jerusalem in Israel, and Mecca in Saudi Arabia. Those are the cities that control the world, and they control the world through religion. Now, I'm not just talking about the exoteric variant that they give to the mindless masses to believe in. No, I'm talking about they are the membership of the old religion. The priest class of the old religion still dwells in the ex exoteric centers of world religion. You want to know who really is issuing the marching orders for the political organizations and the financial organizations of the world? You need to look no further than the Vatican. They're at the top of the food chain. You better listen to Jordan Maxwell when he tells you that too because the man knows what the hell he's talking about. This is who's at the highest level of the dark occult. You want to see their connection to international banking? We'll talk about that. Their connection to the occult? I had a whole section I had to remove from this presentation called the Vatican and the mob. You want to see the real ruthlessness of, organized, of the sorcerers behind organized religion? You study the connection between organized crime and the Vatican. And you'll be horrified to an extent that you ne never have been. They control the political organizations, the financial organizations, and the organized crime organizations. You better believe it and bet your ass on it. Deep behind the Vatican walls are safely nestled some of the highest level adepts of the dark Luciferian priest class who live in full awareness that the exoteric religion they are peddling to the masses is a false spiritual doctrine. This dark occult priest class is entrenched at the core of all religious holy cities, including Vatican City, Jerusalem, Mecca, and others. The members of this diverse worldwide priest class are united by their deep level occulted knowledge about the operation of the laws of nature, which they use to manipulate others to comply with their insidious will. Instead of using knowledge for transformational purposes, they use it to manipulate, control, conquer, and enslave. They're flaunting their symbolism of their knowledge and power in front of the mindless masses who know nothing about what the symbolism represents. They're telling people out in the open, we are the illuminated ones, we are the, the knowledgeable ones, the pine cone represented the awakening, pineal gland, activated spirituality, resurrection from the dead, the empty sarcophagus, the Peacock's alchemical symbols of awakening and transformation. They're telling people, we're the enlightened ones. We've reached spiritual attainment. You know, while you have a house full of pedophile priests. While you're sitting on $18 trillion in wealth while people go poor and homeless. That's what Jesus was telling people. Thou shalt accumulate $18 trillion in wealth. Yeah. We'll get to prosperity Christianity a little later. Whoever drew this knows what's up. That's all I'm going to say. Whoever drew that knows how the world works and is run. They know how the world is run. I don't know who made that, but whoever made drew this, I used your art in my presentation. I took it from Google Images. And get in touch with me because I know you know what's up. Okay? Because that's the force that runs the world right there. Religion still and always has run the world. Because you've got to understand what, what, what these puppets that he's holding just represent other religions. 
They just represent the religion of money and the state. That's all. They're the religions. Big daddy religion is behind big daddy government. Big daddy religion is behind big daddy money. That's all this is. They're all religions. And the priest class is at the highest level of them all. And that brings us to the Vatican and the occult. Now, the most accurate depiction I've ever seen in Hollywood of any occult proceedings and how they really work is Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut. I hope everyone has seen that movie. If you haven't, you, should, you need to see it. I participated in something that was quite less extravagant than what was depicted there, which obviously would have been higher level dark occultism and Luciferianism. You know, they're in a real mansion. I attended rituals at Mick Mansions. Okay. So, um, uh, there are strata within the occult. And then you go into the, the big mansion called the Vatican, and I'm going to show you some shots from inside the Vatican. This is where the priest class resides. This is, they're hoarding all the knowledge that is necessary to free us. They're hoarding the knowledge of our true origins. They're hoarding the knowledge of true spirituality. They're hoarding the knowledge of what human beings truly could become and the, the powers that they could actually really develop, which they don't want to see us develop, those kind of mental and spiritual capabilities. And they rule from a place of total secrecy and darkness. The only way they can continue their reign is through ignorance. They don't want this knowledge coming out. Here's some stuff to look into about the dark occult and the Vatican. Who are the Jesuits? Now, deep inside the Jesuits, they are a secret society called the Society of Jesus. And they're connected deeply with military intelligence and with intelligence agencies like the CIA. Let me tell you something. Jesuits comprise a lot of United States intelligence. They're working deeply inside our own intelligence agencies. Opus Dei, this is a a cult organization within the Roman church in the modern day. Consider themselves the doers of God's work, which is what Opus Dei means, God's work. You want to look up the money connection to all of this? Check out the book God's Banker and the connections to the Propaganda Due Lodge, P2, in Italy, a clandestine Masonic Lodge syndicate. This man with the current quote-unquote Pope Francis is uh, uh, Alfon Alfonso Nicholas. Uh, um, yeah, Alfonso Nicholas. He's considered the black pope of, uh, of um, the Jesuit order. Many people say that he sits behind the throne of the pope and is the real pope in, indeed who doesn't really change during his lifetime. And, you know, the other popes are really just, you know, puppets sitting in and he's telling them what to do. Now we do have a Jesuit pope in Francis. He is actually a Jesuit and is obviously very in with the black pope, Nicholas. These are wolves in sheep's clothing. This is, you know, what was talked about to beware of in the New Testament. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing who are inwardly ravening wolves. That's what this priest class is, folks. They want to pretend that they're holy. These aren't holy men. They never have been and never will be. The amount of knowledge that the Vatican hoards and keeps to itself is astronomically insane. Their libraries go on endlessly and they contain the true knowledge of human origins, which is why they had to be secreted away, hidden, occulted. Me mainstream media did a story recently. 
Oh, the Vatican's opening up their secret archives. Yeah, they're opening up their secret archives. First of all, the word secret archives, ar archivio secreto Vaticano, it doesn't mean secret archives. It means the private archives, meaning it's reserved only for them. That's it. The word secreto in Italian means private, more so than it means secret, meaning simply hidden. It means it is our property. It's our private property. They consider this their knowledge to dispense to whoever they see fit to receive it. And so this reporter, all proud of himself, I'm going to be one of the first 25 reporters led into the Vatican secret archives. You know, writes his article and, and says, we were not actually allowed to look at any books. We were just allowed to pass through under guard of the Swiss guard and the gendarmerie, which is the actual security force of Rome, the police of Rome, with fully automatic military weapons trained on them should they step out of line and try to touch something they weren't allowed to. But they opened the archives, folks. This is what our media will tell you. These complicit, scumbag, paid liars, criminals, is what the media is. The Vatican's have always supported totalitarian rulers throughout time. Their support of totalitarian efforts is legendary, particularly in the 20th century with the Nazis. Did nothing. Ab Pius XII did nothing to stop them the brutal treatment of Jews in Germany and other people in Germany during the Nazi regime. Read the book Hitler's Pope about the collusion between the Nazis and the Vatican. You have to know about Operation Paperclip. I mean, Paperclip brought so many, tens of thousands of Nazis to the United States. Tens of thousands, particularly to the East Coast in New York and New Jersey. The Vatican helped secret them over here. They helped, they helped slip them in under the rug so that they would avoid war crimes tribunals at Nuremberg. Holy men. Yeah. Here's a picture of the Pope with Hitler, uh, or card. I'm not sure if that's a cardinal or a Pope with Hitler, and then there's some cardinals there with uh, our wonderful man, um, Goebbels. Wonderful guy. Minister of Propaganda of the Third Reich, Joseph Goebbels. Look, just on the East Coast alone, like I said in the morning session, at least 80,000 Nazis were unleashed into the state of New Jersey, which I call New Germany. And I'm telling you, they, they didn't just bring their political ideology. This was not just a political ideology. This is a religion. Again, I'm going to do a presentation called The Occult Roots of Nazism and Communism and show how they're essentially one and the same. They're just variants of the old religion. They're just giving you another name for the old religion of Satanism slash dark Luciferianism. Nazism is a form of it, and communism is a form of it. Look, the highest holiday of the Satanic year, and I should know this because I participated in many a ritual on this day, is May 1st, Valpurgis Nacht. St. Valpurgis's Night. Okay, it is the midpoint of spring and it is a fertility ritual day because it's about renewal and giving blood and, and uh, life to back to the earth so that the earth and the sun can allow the crops that are planted in the spring to grow and have a bountiful harvest in the summer and fall. May 1st is the high holiday of Satanism. Valpurgis not. Now, you look up for me, what is the high holiday of the communist year? May 1st, May Day. What, is, what was celebrated as the high holiday of the Nazi year? May 1st, the fertility rites of spring, the festival of light, the risen sun, the black sun. May 1st. You're going to tell me 
It's a coincidence that Satanism, Nazism, and Communism all share the same high holiday of the year. And once again, I'm going to tell you that you belong in an insane asylum if you believe that that's a coincidence. You know, that people who think this are coincidence theorists. I'm not the, I'm not the conspiracy theorist. I'm a studied scholar when it comes to this work. I did my homework over decades. Okay? I have no theories. The theory is it's all coincidence. There's no, there's no pattern there that the highest holidays of, the, of, of, of Satanism, Nazism, and Communism happen to be the same. You just magically chose. The, the communists were like, oh yeah, wait, well, is this a satanic holiday? Yeah, let's just do the same thing. Why, you know, yeah, and then the Nazis did the same thing. Yeah, okay. It's like people don't even understand how fucking stupid they sound sometimes. They really don't. The Vatican and pedophile cover-up. Let's leave you with this one before you go to dinner. Okay? Yeah. How many people here have watched the documentary Sex Crimes and the Vatican? Unacceptable. Unacceptable. I'm shocked, appalled, and horrified. Watch this video, folks. Watch it. That's all I have to say. Just watch the damn video. Sex, crimes, and the Vatican. Just go look it up. And then throw up. This man, Ratzinger, aptly named, by the way, this rat. Look at that rat. I mean, he just looks like a rat. Covered up the pedophilia happening within the church. Paid all family. This guy was the financial guy who was set up. He was given the papacy because he paid off. So, he was given the job to pay off molested children's families so that they wouldn't report the crimes and, and, and it wouldn't spread in awareness. And then he would take the parishioner, the, 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 the um, priest from one parish and move him to another parish so he can go and molest more boys and girls. That's what this rat, Ratzinger, Benedict, another perfect name, Rat Benedict, like Benedict Arnold. Benedict, what was he, the 16th? Okay, that's what his job in the Vatican was. They've been, this newspaper article doesn't even touch it close. For try 30,000 years, this priest class has been covering up pedophilia and molestation of children. It's disgusting. I mean, you want to talk about people who should be crucified. Yeah, the Catholic Church with his blinder on, swinging at a pinata, saying, don't worry, we're finally taking action to stop this problem. Yeah, sure you are. Yeah, you're moving the, the priest to another parish so you can go repeat the same crime. They're trash. Here's the thing we, we're, we failed to report on, folks. Pedophilia. I just went to an alternative researcher's lecture in Philadelphia. At a church, by the way. Was expecting to hear a lot of you know, revelations, and he did have some good information. And then uh, I'm sitting on the pew in the church listening to this guy. I'm not going to mention his name, because I, I don't think he's a bad guy. I just think he's not all the way there. And he goes, you know... I think what might really wake America up is if we had a child pedophile scandal. And I just went, I, I like, like, almost like fell off, like just, I, I fell into a puddle on the floor out of the church pew. Like, if we had this, and you're calling yourself an alternative researcher for truth and freedom? Like, what do you think the Franklin cover-up was? How many people have read the book, The Franklin Cover-Up? Oh, that's good. Okay, so we're, uh, a few, several people. Good. Not enough, though. Everybody in this room should have read that book. And again, you want to throw up for many hours, you know, please take me up on that challenge and read it. 
The, mo the documentary Conspiracy of Silence on YouTube talks about the Franklin cover-up. How many people have seen Conspiracy of Silence? About the same amount that have read the book. Yeah, very, very good documentary. Well, well done. And only aired on the internet. Didn't make it to mainstream television, of course. But we dropped the ball on Pizzagate. Dropped the ball. Because the stupid leftists out there bought the whole Russian hacking narrative because they love them, their Hillary Clinton so much. I mean, you've got to be joking, people. You absolutely have to be joking, and it's not even a funny joke. That's how much, just because, you know, women wanted to vote in a female president, they are going to vote in a criminal like that. Not that Trump is that much better. Not that any of them are any good people. None of them are good people. Okay? But you're going to ignore the entire John Podesta email scandal. That's what Pe Pizzagate is about. Pedophile code in official government emails. Known pedophile code by our FBI and our CIA code that is known out in the open to be about the trafficking of small children. Written in government agency emails. Yeah, I, I talk about, oh, is, is it easier for me? To, well, I do better playing, playing dominoes on pasta rather than cheese. Yeah, that makes a lot of human sense, work language like that, doesn't it? They're not talking about anything covert or secret. Who, who, for first of all, who in government is going to write emails on a government server talking about pizza, cheese, pasta, and pasta sauce? I mean, if you believe that, you are fucking retarded. That's, that's the, oh, the plain way I have to say it. You have to be retarded to actually believe that high-level gov government officials are writing emails talking about goddamn slices of pizza and hot dogs. Hot dogs represent, it's a phallic symbol for a young boy, a, a, a small penis. And the um, pizza represents the, the slice of pizza is the womb of a, of a small girl. I mean, and people can't, because they have no relational thinking. They can't even get the symbology of it and how they're, it's pedophile code. And so instead of actually reporting on the biggest crime gate of the century, the whole pedo gate phenomenon. We dropped the ball because we believe the assholes in the mainstream media saying that it was Russian hackers that invented the storyline. People are really, they're really a disgrace in their lack of discernment and judgment. They really are. The unparalleled hypocrisy of the Vatican. Look at this guy. This clown, Francis. People who manufacture weapons or invest in weapons industries are hypocrites if they call themselves Christian. Yet he's got uh, people with guns that the Vatican buys and funds all over the place. Now believe me, I have no problem with everybody carrying a gun. But don't be hypocritical about it like that. No, because the ruling class thinks they're entitled to protection, but you're not. That's what they think. I'll pray for the poor and those less fortunate from my golden throne. Yeah, 18 trillion dollars of debt. Thrones made of gold. They're holy men. And this is what jackasses in Italy that go and sit and hang on their every word at the Vatican and gather in St. Peter's Square. I'm, you're an embarrassment to my ancestry and lineage. Italian people who go and gather in these pedophiles village. You're trash. See, I don't play sides when it comes to nationality. I'll call them trash Italians. Trash is what they are. A person who thinks only about building walls wherever they may be and not building bridges is not a Christian. Behold the Vatican's bridge that they have built. A 40 foot four-story wall encompassing the entire Vatican City. You know. Now, they don't believe in walls. Hey, I'm not about the building of all the walls myself either. But, again, this is just pure hypocrite. They speak out of both sides of their mouth. It's pure hypocrisy.
I'm going to end on this section. What in Christ's name do they have people worshiping? This is the, the title image of my presentation. That's supposed to be a depiction of Jesus descending into the underworld before he was resurrected. Now, if you just saw that, just look at that and tell, just tell me what that looks like, first of all. What does it look like? A demon or a dinosaur or a reptile with its head turned to the side. You can see the eye, the skull, the teeth, you know, in the jaw coming down. He's got his tail and wings. That's supposed to be Jesus because the face of Jesus is embedded on the neck. That's all. It's flatly embedded on the neck to give the appearance that that's his hair. And this is what they have standing in the back of Paul the Sixth Hall, okay, at the Vatican, where the Pope lectures from. Here's an up close image. One of the closest images that someone was ever able to take of this statue. You could clearly see it's a reptile slash dinosaur head, and Jesus is simply, his face is embedded, is just sculpted onto the neck of the existing creature. And it's made to look like his hair. I mean, who would even, that's just bad sculpting. Who would even sculpt something like that? Not only is it horrific aesthetically, it's just, it's like you, you can't even sculpt the human form properly because they're not trying to. It is a dinosaur slash reptilian slash demon. This is Paul the Sixth Hall. I believe it's Paul the Sixth Hall. Paul, it's all the fourth or sixth. I think it's Paul the sixth, Paul. If someone can look that up and correct me. Okay? That the actual architecture of the hall is a snake with fangs, complete with fangs. He is in the mouth. That statue of, quote, Jesus is in the mouth of a huge serpent. This is who's running the Vatican. No, they're not dark occultists. Don't worry about it, folks. Just go home, forget everything I said. I don't know what I'm talking about. And people go there and bow down and worship these people. That's what is directly behind the Pope when he lectures at this hall in front of a packed house of blind true believers every time. Now, when we get back from dinner... I am going to read the recent comments that the Pope made about libertarians and libertarianism. And I have a challenge that I'm going to issue to our current Pope, Francis. Thank you for listening to this section. I'll see you all after dinner.